number 10, kleptomania. If you were a queen, then you would think that you had enough money to just buy whatever your little heart desired. Though that may be true, there was at least one famous queen who just straight up stole things just because she could. Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth's grandmother, was quite the kleptomaniac and no matter how hard people tried to avoid having their things stolen by her, it just never worked. When the queen would visit someone's house, she would walk around looking at whatever knickknacks you had lying around, and when she found something that she liked, she would stand there and just sigh super loudly to get someone's attention. Much like how my dog used to sigh dramatically when he wanted food. Anyways, usually when someone heard the sigh, they knew that this was a sign that the queen wanted whatever she was gazing upon. Sometimes the homeowner would just give whatever it was to the queen as a gift, gift. But if it was something that they weren't willing to part with, then she would either try to buy it off them or just straight up take it when no one was looking. This became such a big problem that people started hiding their prized possessions before hosting the queen in their home, but she eventually caught on to this strategy, so she just started showing up uninvited. She could not rest until she owned pretty much everything in the kingdom. Number nine, no time to dine. If I'm eating, don't acknowledge me as a human being. I sound like a pug when I eat, okay? I don't waste any time. I love food, okay, it's business. Now, if you're a queen and you eat fast, well, everybody else has to eat fast as well. This began back in Queen Victoria's time. The queen loved to feast and she didn't waste any time at all. Like, it's really fast. The way the royal family works is that when the queen is done that course or that meal, you're also done. So when Queen Victoria would smash an entire seven course meal in 30 minutes, which apparently she could do easily, you'd be blowing on your soup still and Queen Victoria would already be telling everybody to pack it up. That's stressful. All because she could eat lots of food in a short amount of time. Also, once the queen gave a toast, you couldn't even speak. Also, once the queen placed her cutlery on the table, regardless of where you were during that course, everybody's plate would then be taken away at the same time. And the next one would then come in. I would just put my food in my pockets, you know? Screw it. It's almost like when you go to all you can eat sushi and you have like some sushi left over, you don't want to waste it. You're like, you know what? I'm not paying that bill. At number eight, no side bays. A bad relationship can really mess you up. Anyone who's been through a bad breakup can tell you that. Not as many people carry that pain with them as much as Catherine de' Medici did back in the day. Hurt didn't even begin to describe how she felt and she really embodied the pain that she was feeling after having her heart broken. She basically turned into the type of person that was like, if I'm not happy, no one else is gonna be happy either. Catherine's husband, Henry II of France, had a mistress and Catherine was well aware of it. They had been having an affair for basically the whole time Catherine was married to Henry, and he loved his mistress more than he ever loved his wife. When Henry was on his deathbed, his final request was to see his mistress one last time, and as a final F you to her husband, not only did she deny the mistress from visiting Henry, but she literally made him die alone with no one by his side when he kicked the bucket. On top of this hatred towards her husband though, Catherine was also an absolute B word to her daughter as well. Catherine would fight her daughter over her romantic affairs. I guess she didn't want her daughter to be like her father. Either way, Catherine got so mad about one of her daughter's affairs that when she found out about her lover, she locked her daughter away in a castle and never saw her again. Talk about a serious grudge. Number seven, check on the dead. Funerals are pretty expensive, especially a royal one at that. It takes a lot of power to dig up and then carry these massive caskets around, which back in the day was even more exhausting. Joanna of Castile was born in 1479. Her marriage to the Duke of Austria was arranged, but she was very much in love, maybe a bit too much, hear me out. When her husband met his fate in 1506 due to typhoid fever, Joanna would have his tomb unearthed and then opened over and over again, just so she could make sure that he was still there. Now, of course, I feel bad for the queen here. She was clearly not coping with his death well, but to have his tomb or casket or coffin, whatever you want to call it, to have it opened and closed over and over and then dug up and then put back in the ground, she would make people carry his body around everywhere she went. That's heavy. That is so much work. Even keeping it under her bed sometimes. Ugh, I got goosebumps just saying that. That's pretty creepy. Ashes, I can understand. That's like a one-man job to carry that around. But a thousand pound royal coffin? They have to carry 30 city blocks? My back already hurts thinking of that. No thank you, I quit. At number six, deadly affairs. Dating is hard. 
If you've ever been on dating apps like Tinder or Bumble, then you know that things aren't as easy as it may seem when it comes to finding someone that you remotely like. Maybe we should take a page out of Queen Nzinga's book when it comes to dating because it seemed like she had fun with her escapades. Well, maybe don't actually do what she did because it's actually pretty gruesome, but you get what I'm saying. Queen Nzinga from what is now modern day Angola was a busy woman. After taking over the throne from her brother, she juggled the monarchy, wars with the Portuguese, and having a love life. The queen pulled together a harem of only the most attractive men, but because she was such a busy person, she didn't really have the time to walk into a room and choose who she was going to sleep with that night, so she came up with an alternative solution. Nzinga would have two members of her harem fight each other to the death every night, and whoever won got to sleep with the queen. Solid plan, right? Well, the winner wasn't really all that lucky for too long, because she would have the winner executed the following day. Number 5. Diamond Scandals Queen Mary wasn't the only queen with sticky fingers, it seems. The affair of the diamond necklace has sparked many conversations. France's queen from 1774 to 1792 was Marie Antoinette, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because she was the last queen before the French Revolution. She was also known for spending a buck on jewelry. She liked she liked the diamonds. Now this Countess de Lamotte was this young lady, a friend of the Queen supposedly, who entered the French court in 1785. Now she got somebody to disguise herself as the Queen and then she acted like she was in love with this high society member, all to get her hands on this 12 million dollar necklace. Now she said that she would pay but never ended up paying a dime, so that's horrible by itself. And the Queen supposedly had no idea about any of this or what happened to the necklace. Although this countess pretended to be her friend beforehand. The public went on to hate her for this, not believing in the scandal of course. One of the most notable lines from Marie Antoinette was when the French spoke out for not being able to afford bread. She apparently said, well let them eat cake, which led into the French Revolution and ultimately her demise. Shine bright like a diamond, I guess. At number 4, Test Drives. Catherine the Great of Russia was well known for a number of things. She was known for being a good leader, a strong ruler, and surprisingly for her naughty bedroom fun times as well. She was well known for her adventures in baby making, and there was once a rumor that she did the deed with a horse. Obviously that wasn't actually true, however she did do it with a lot of men. The only problem that she really faced when it came to finding a new partner was actually having the time to do so. I mean, it's not like she could swipe through Tinder while sitting on her throne, right? What was most important to her was finding a new lover who was skilled in the sack and she didn't really want to waste time on testing these guys out, so she had someone else do it for her. Catherine had a friend take her potential partner out on a test drive, so to speak, so that she wasn't wasting her time on someone who couldn't meet her standards. Remember, she is a very busy woman. It is said that on a couple of occasions, Catherine's tester friend was caught in bed with Catherine's partner again, well after the Empress was with him and that made things a little complicated, but I imagine that they got past that. Or at least I really hope they did. Number three, change religion. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336, Queen Nefertiti aka Lady of Grace aka the Lost Queen of Egypt was only 15 years old when she married 16 year old Akhenaten. Now alongside her new young husband she built an entirely new capital city called Amarna and ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in ancient Egyptian history. But when it comes to spoiled queens or rather queens who could do anything they believe with their power, we have to mention the queen that changed Egypt's religion. Both her and her co-ruler were in a cult, the cult of the sun god, Atan. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time, and there have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Thibian tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, part of the sun god rituals. So now cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Atan was now Egypt's main god. Some queens change laws, others change religion. At number two, fake village. Imagine being so privileged and so disconnected from the world that you pretend to be poor for fun. Well, that's pretty much what Marie Antoinette did. This French queen was known for her lavish and opulent lifestyle and that's really the only life that she knew. Apparently, living the life of a rich queen started to get a little boring for her and she wanted to find an escape and so she got her people to build a fake village for her so that she could pretend to be a commoner. This fake village included 11 cottages, a lake, a water mill, a 
working dairy, a windmill, a barn, and other quote unquote peasant buildings. Maria apparently loved this little peasant village and she would bring other people to enjoy it too. When she brought her guests to the village, she expected them to yes and their way through the day and really immerse themselves into their role of a common person. She would even tell her ladies to ditch the ball gowns and wear something simple to blend in. Marie even took her kids to the fake village to teach them about farming. Even though she loved her pretend peasant lifestyle, it still didn't help her bond with the real common people and it certainly didn't save her from the guillotine. And finally coming in at a number one spot, surprise entrance. The last true pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra VII ruled from 69 to 30 BC. She's known mainly for her love interests, of course, her two mans, Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar. And to this day, we're still trying to uncover more dazzling details of the lost queen. Now, she ruled alongside her young brother, and her life was much more than being just beautiful, which is what everyone seems to focus on more than anything. Both children were assigned to the throne, Cleopatra being 18 and little bro being 10 years old. So Cleopatra, being a little older, therefore a little wiser, became the ruler. A couple of years passed and eventually Cleopatra was pushed out of Alexandria over her greed for power, classic, but her little brother, equally a co-ruler, had her driven out. He was jealous and honestly, I'm the youngest in my family, I kinda get it. But Cleopatra wasn't quite done yet, she had a few tricks up her sleeve. Believing she was the goddess Isis reborn, this beautiful goddess, Cleopatra made these dazzling entrances whenever she could. Most notably in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria during that family feud with Ptolemy VIII. She wanted to meet the Roman general, but she couldn't be seen because of a little bit of family beef, so she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack and then personally delivered to Caesar's bedroom. Hashtag your order has arrived. Surprise. Now she won the heart of Rome's future dictator here, obviously, and eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance, and in the following battle, he drowned in the Nile River, resulting in Cleopatra's return to power. At number 10, blinded by ambition. I don't know about you, but I think my favorite part of these queens list is learning about all the wild and crazy things that queens did to keep or acquire power back in the days of old. Like these gals were absolutely ruthless, and they weren't afraid to absolutely body anyone who stood in their way. We've heard about queens taking out enemy tribes, their husbands, and even their own family members. This all sounds like a round of Call of Duty when you're the last one on your team and you're just murking everyone in sight trying to save your own skin. Let's talk about a queen, or rather empress, who was so desperate for power that she ended up killing her own son. Irene of Athens was an empress from the Byzantine Empire who ruled from 797 to 802 CE. She started her reign as co-ruler alongside her son, Emperor Constantine IV. Though it started as a good old family business, you know, saving people, hunting things, not really. Things went south as they normally did back then. Irene wanted all the power to herself and so she sought out to eliminate her competition, her own son. Irene lured her son into the very room that he was born in and gouged his eyes out. Like ma'am, this is not ice cream. You can't just scoop eyeballs out and make a sundae out of them. Thank you. That's not how that works. <laughs> Constantine ended up dying as a result of his injuries and since his own heir had passed away earlier that year, the transition of power ended up going to Irene who became emperor. Yes, emperor, not empress, because she was the sole ruler, making her the first woman to do so. Number nine, topless duels. Yeah, you heard me. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens, but she was born in 1836 and she had to marry her uncle when she was 20 years old. So surprise, surprise, she was unhappy. Who knew? Weird, right? Since the marriage began, her husband was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, anyone glamorous or hot or cool. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun, live a life maybe. Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she partied, she defined convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess of the matter, to a duel and nothing but a corset. Now to this day, it's not yet determined who exactly won this duel, this corset poke off, but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks, that should be a musical, not Frozen, get out of here. At number eight, cross-dressing. Empress Elizabeth was quite the character, I guess you could say. Since she was a monarch, she could do whatever she wanted, and that is exactly what she did. You see, she was quite into fashion, more specifically, men's fashion. The Empress believed that she just had legs for days, like Naomi Campbell, and she wanted to show them off to the world, but the only problem with that was the fact that back then, pants were reserved for men, and so 
though since she wore dresses all the time, no one got to see her godly legs. Well, to combat that, Elizabeth came up with a solution. She was known to hold huge parties where everyone had to cross dress. She only did this so that it would give her an excuse to wear pants. And I mean, she could have if she just wanted to wear them on a regular day, but she didn't want to be the only woman in men's clothing, so she made everyone else dress up too. At these parties, no one looked good or really enjoyed themselves for that matter. Women complained that the men's clothing they wore to these parties were unflattering, and the men were just all over the place because they didn't know how to maneuver a hoop skirt. The only person really having a fun time was Empress Elizabeth, but I guess that was really the whole point. Number seven. Two for one. When you're deemed the most beautiful woman in all the realm of England and the most loving, well, odds are you're going to need two husbands. All that love to give, it only makes sense. Joan of Kent was named as such, and at the age 12, so gross, she was married for the first time. She fell in love with a knight named Thomas Holland. Yeah, she dated Tom Holland, the knight Spider-Man guy, that's great. He was 26 and she was 12, still gross, but they got married in secret. She knew her parents wouldn't be on board, he was broke, and yeah, he was also 26, so so for obvious reasons, it had to be a little hush-hush. Even in royal standard, that's a bit odd. After the wedding, Thomas had to go off to war, and he wasn't gone for too long before, well, she remarried. The son of the Earl of Salisbury slid into her DMs, and Joan thought Tom Holland's Spider Knight was dead. Well, Thomas returned, like he did in Endgame, but they were legal issues now. Ultimately, Joan and Thomas got together and had four children, but after Thomas did die, Joan became the first ever Princess of Wales. So if you love someone, just, you know, marry them. Even if the other person's still just over there, just marry them both, see what happens. At number six, apple of his eye. I feel like this queen I'm about to tell you about needs to have her own movie made about her or something because the things she did for power were almost unbelievable. I would say that I would want to be her when I grow up, but she's kind of responsible for the deaths of a lot of people, and that's not really something I'm striving for, you know? But she did have a lot of determination. I will give her that. Isabella was married to King Edward II of England, and though she was quite the catch, Isabella wasn't really all that jazzed about him. She was like, meh, I guess I'll be your wife, even though back then she really wouldn't have a choice in the matter anyway. Anyways, after 10 years of marriage and the birth of an heir, things seemed to be relatively okay between the king and queen. That is, until the king started getting all buddy-buddy with his friend Hugh Dispenser, who was a much hated noble. Very hated. Hated numero uno. Isabella didn't like the bromance that was forming and she was like, uh, no, the only person who gets the king's attention is me. So she rallied the support of the other nobles, banished the Dispenser family, burned their castles to the ground, claimed their possessions, and killed anyone who supported the disgraced family. After all of that went down, she took refuge in the Tower of London, where she met a prisoner whom she smuggled to France. Then she got her husband to bring their son to France. And from there, with the support of the nobles and the common people, she was able to defeat her husband and the dispensers and became queen regent until her son Edward III came of age to become king. After all of that, she finally got her way. I hope she slept well that night because she did the most. Number five, rebel princess. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Home, who only a year and a half later took his own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic. Keep it up. At number four, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as queen regent, but soon a growing conflict started causing a lot of tension between the 
the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. Gone. Rainey killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number three, Chelonis. The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the 3rd century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chelones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Architatus, son of King Eris I. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. How about the tea on that? Chelonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now luckily he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful. But back in the day, makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also cost some serious health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products, but for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you. Or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup. Like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead ore, vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one. Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just a casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chime. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back a wife. Carry on, also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off for clout. Number 10, Elizabeth I. Good old Queen Bess is one of the most remembered queens in the British monarchy, male or female. She's a pretty big deal. Elizabeth loved to make her fellow male nobles fall under her spell. She was witty, cunning, and very well liked by her court. However, one of the things that earned her some enemies was establishing a Protestant England. Her sister Mary, her predecessor, fought very hard for the opposite. She was very Catholic, and we will get to how bloody that was later, but Queen Bess a lot of people off, especially Spain. She was supposed to marry the Catholic Spanish king after her sister passed, but uh, she turned him down. This led to a conflict between Protestant England and Catholic Spain, but her navy defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Mary, Queen of Scots, laid claim to the English throne and was one of Lizzie's greatest internal threats. Mary was a Catholic, which made all the Catholics of England back her. Mary was also presumed to be behind several assassination attempts against the queen. Finally, 
Finally, Queen Elizabeth had to take action, and after keeping her cousin hostage for 20 years, she finally had to have her executed. And we'll talk more about her later. Number nine, Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great was called the Great for a reason. She was a pretty epic woman by most accounts. She even had one of the first vaccines, which is pretty crazy. Though she wasn't actually born in Russia or even Russian at all, Catherine was not content to go down in history quietly. She considered herself an enlightened ruler, and history tends to agree with aims of prioritizing education for the people. She had many lovers, and there is enough evidence to suggest that the son she had was illegitimate. Peter III of Russia was hardly the man Catherine intended on marrying, and later planned a coup against him which resulted in her position of power. However, the coup did turn bloody when on July 17th, Peter died under mysterious circumstances. There isn't proof that she was directly involved or even knew about it, but it cast a dark shadow over her reign for the rest of the time. Number eight, Grace O'Malley. We've got enough traditional royalty on this list that we definitely need to spice it up. Enter Grace O'Malley, the pirate queen of Ireland. Pirate queen, what a title. Definitely considered unholy behavior, Grace abandoned the traditions of women of the time and fled to the sea. There, she took on the waves and perils of Davy Jones' locker with a legendary ferocity. She was born into the clan O'Malley around 1530, around the time of Henry VIII's rule over England and Ireland. Clan O'Malley was a notorious seafaring clan and ruled the southern shore of Clue Bay, Aquiland, and most of the barony of Murrisk for over 300 years. Grace was really well educated and could even converse fully in Latin, Spanish, Scottish, Gaelic, and French. She was not one to be refused, and after spending years fighting the British, she finally met Queen Bess. And not only did she speak Latin to her, but she refused used to bow as she was considered a queen herself by that point. Number seven, Mary Queen of Scots. I told you I was gonna bring her up. A name you will recognize as I've already mentioned her before, but in terms of who the villain in that story is, it depends on which side you're telling the story on. Mary's story is full of tragedy, romance, betrayal, loss, and heartbreak. Unlike Lizzie, Mary was a dedicated Catholic and spent the entirety of her reign trying to gather the Catholics against Elizabeth. She had a series of marriages and relationships that led to tragedy every which way she went. Her first husband, the Dauphin of France, died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband, she loved until he became a drunkard, and then she just started running things. But he was mysteriously unalive while she was six months pregnant. He was inside a building that exploded, but his body landed outside and it turned out he was strangled. So what happened there? She would later give birth to two stillborn sons, but she would have sons later on. She would have a son who would inherit the throne after Elizabeth's death, but it was due to Mary's plotting and scheming that eventually ended her in death. So so she did actually plot to kill Elizabeth. So that's a pretty unholy deed, I would say. Number six. Princess Olga of Kiev. Okay, wow, this woman. One saint you definitely don't want to mess with. Despite being a saint, Princess Olga of Kiev was actually pretty sinful. She was one of the most vicious and vengeful rulers in the history of Kievan Rus, which would later become Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Olga took center stage after her husband died and made sure she would never be forgotten. Her husband died in a very gruesome way by the enemies that we're going to talk about in a second. When the people who viciously unalived her husband tried to persuade her to marry their leader, they sent 20 men. Olga told them to wait in their boats, had her men dig a ditch in the meantime, and the next morning buried the men alive. She then lied and told the king she would accept his offer if he sent his best company to retrieve her. He didn't know about all that stuff yet. When they got there, she locked them in a bathhouse and torched it. But it didn't stop there. Olga didn't stop there. That's not her style. She would later host a steak dinner with her enemies in which they were staked. Very Vlad the Impaler, I know. Then she set whole villages on fire by attaching sulfur to pigeons, and then it was just crazy. Damn, like hell has no fury like a woman scorned, let me tell you. Number five, Queen Isabella I. The Spanish Inquisition, pretty high up there as far as terrifying points in history go. If you weren't willing to convert to Catholicism, you were tormented, interrogated, and burned at the stake. Who was behind this awful time in history? This lady, Queen Isabella I. Technically, as she was fighting for a holy order for the Catholic Church, this can be seen as holy, but was it? Burning people at the stake because they didn't share this belief? Ah, not cool, Isabel. She created a secular government through her reign, which allowed for the monarchy to have more power. Being a pious Catholic, she made Catholicism the official religion and created a tribunal to make this happen. Secret service or secret police that spread fear wherever they went. Her direct influence caused the Jewish population to falter for a really long time after. Number four, Friedegun of Soissons. Okay, maybe said that wrong, so I apologize. Kind of impressed with her rise to power. She went from slave attendant 
to queen. How do you bridge that gap? No idea. Boy was she ferocious. Assassination and manipulation were her main political tools. Fritigan was among a small number of enslaved women in the Merovingian household that became a queen. Merovingian was the OG Central Europe before everything got split up. She survived political dangers and retained her husband's loyalty and could persuade monks and priests to jump onto her plots with ease. She encouraged her husband, the king, to set aside his first wife and then even take the life of his second. But his second wife, Galswinda, had a sister named Brunhild who became the mortal enemy of Fredegund. She had good reason to be. Fredegund continued to do everything she could to secure her position, one assassination after the next. She was a pretty stormy lady. Number 3, Bathory. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Technically not a queen, I get it, but she might as well have been with the power that she had. So fight me. She's remembered as the most evil woman in the world in history, I think. I don't know. That's my opinion. Bathory was the stuff of nightmares. Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560 into a prominent Hungarian noble family, making her practically untouchable. She married a very famous war hero who is suspected of gifting Bloody Lizzie with the skills she used to kill. After she died, Bathory became obsessed with immortality. Supposedly when one of her servants accidentally spilt blood on her and her skin appeared younger after. Bathory then began her mission of horror, luring over 650 young virgin women to her palace and brutally taking their lives. She was even bold enough to lure daughters of nobility. Before draining them of their blood, she would make them suffer in ways you don't even want to imagine before bathing in the blood itself. When she was finally caught, three of her servants were executed but she was simply locked away in her tower for the rest of her days on house arrest. Ugh. Number 2, Catherine de Medici, also known as the Serpent Queen. History colors her story as the tale of the evil queen. On one hand, she is remembered for being one of the most powerful French queens in history, and then on the other, she was blamed for the many atrocities that took place during her reign. Her regency was marked by the French wars of religion and the many games Catherine played within them. The Catholics and the Protestants, as previously mentioned, were at war, and she spent a lot of time trying to find peace. Kind of. But she was a passionate Catholic and is believed to have tried to remove a Protestant general from her son's side. When he survived the attack, she lied and convinced her son that the Protestants were responsible, so she scapegoated them. So he authorized taking the lives of their leaders. Enter St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Catherine implicated the general, which resulted in him being the first to be beaten and then tossed out of his own bedroom window. An estimated 3,000 French Protestants were taken out in Paris, but the total countrywide was around 70,000. And last but not least, Bloody Mary, actually known as Queen Mary the First of England. So no, I'm not talking about the girl you say in the mirror three times so that she appears and you're like, wow, I'm haunted forever. Queen Mary became known as Bloody Mary due to her vicious tirade against Protestants in England during her reign. She even imprisoned her own sister, Elizabeth, who we mentioned at the beginning of this list, due to suspicions of treason. This was unfounded. She bore her father Henry VIII ill will after the stuff he pulled with the church and after having delegitimized her as his heir for a time. After Mary took the throne and married the Catholic King of Spain, she began carrying out her plan for England to become Catholic once again. In 1555, she revived England's heresy laws and began burning offenders at the stake, starting with her father's longtime advisor, Thomas Kramer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. She burned over 300 convicted heretics, most of them being common citizens, and dozens more died in prison, hence giving her the name of Bloody Mary. Kicking off the list at number 10, Heart of Glass. Alexandria of Bavaria, the royal who believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass. I'm not joking, yeah, she was a princess, so not technically a queen, but this is so insane that I had to kick off this list with it. The 23-year-old Bavarian princess was quite the scholar. She was known to enjoy literature, but she equally put energy into convincing those around her that she'd swallowed a piano made entirely of glass when she was a wee child. She grew up afraid that her inner piano would shatter. We have an inner demon. She has an inner piano made of glass. So she would enter rooms slowly and sideways, I'm not kidding, to, you know, avoid cracking that personal piano problem. Just like King Charles VI, he thought he was going to break at any given moment. Saying you were made of glass was quite an uncommon delusion. The victims were more often than not royalty. They had glass. They watched this fancy material shatter in their hands all the time. No wonder, it probably scared them. There's actually a play on this glass delusion. It's called The Glass Piano by Alex Sobler. Quite recent too. Apparently, it's a blast. Check it out if you have the chance. We love that. 
keep writing plays about glass pianos. This is insane. At number nine, Rosemary's Baby. Back in the days of old, it was very important to the monarchy to have a male heir. Many kings throughout history have been known to get very upset when they weren't given a son to inherit the throne, and they put a lot of pressure on their wives to give them a boy. Why? I don't know. Boys kind of stuck. Anyway, this probably drove a lot of people crazy, but there is at least one confirmed case of crazy baby fever from Maria Eleonora. She kept trying to have a baby, but when she finally got pregnant, everyone was hoping for a boy. Unfortunately, the odds weren't in her favor, and she gave birth to a little girl instead. People knew that Maria would get absolutely triggered upon learning of her baby's gender, so they kept it a secret from her as long as they could, but eventually they had to tell her, and Maria was pissed. She really went looking for that receipt to return that baby and get a refund or at least a store credit. When she found out the baby was a girl, the queen reacted by saying, quote, Instead of a son, I am given a daughter, dark and ugly, with a great nose and black eyes. Take her from me, I will not have such a monster. End quote. Like damn, tell her how you really feel. After that, mysterious things started happening to this baby, like a wooden beam mysteriously falling into the baby's crib, and somehow accidentally falling down the stairs. Even even the nurse once dropped the poor kid onto the stone floor. Like, I get it. You're disappointed, but that's still your kid, and a lot of people aren't given that privilege, so be grateful for your spawn. Number eight, dirty talk. Going back to the 15th century to Queen Isabella of Spain, now, it's not uncommon for queens to brag, be it about their wealth, status, their mans, you name it. But to brag that you've only bathed twice in your life, that's a bit odd. What's the deal with this? Okay, well back in 537 AD, Rome had 11 aqueducts that ran over about a thousand public fountains, okay? Over 900 bathhouses included. It was quite important, but when invading Goths cut them off, the Catholic Church literally had no idea how to fix the problem. So instead, they just told everybody that bathing was a sin only practiced by pagans. So at one point in history, you could have ran a bath, thrown in a bath bomb, relaxed for an hour, got out, and then immediately, you're a sinner. Worst of the worst, too. How dare you have it a bath on Monday afternoon, you monster, you pagan monster. The Old Spice guy would have rocked their world. At number seven, Mother Knows Best. I think after hearing about these queens who've done some dark things to get their way, you would think that it's safe to say you don't mess with a woman and her plight for power. Unless you want to end up six feet under, that is. One Roman Empress, Julia Agrippina of Rome, was pretty spoiled already. She lived a lavish life, her husband was the emperor, and she had a family. But that just wasn't enough for her, and she wanted it all. Julia was quite ambitious, and she spent most of her her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, and so she bamboozled her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law so that they could get married. Ew. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died and most people think that Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power, but eventually Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had her forced out of power. Julia, as you can imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world that she desired most. And so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow her son, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. Talk about ambition getting the best of you. Number six, we are family. The last queen of Madagascar. Queen Rana Valona was one of the worst. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was so cruel and violent that she would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with that new power. In the late 1700s, her king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him. The king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king. That king repaid the local by adopting his daughter, Rana Valona, to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now, when her prince was alive, they didn't get along at all. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Rana Lova the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized that she poisoned him too, so that's... Horrible. Ranalova kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Lovely, like bobbleheads. In 1845, Queen Rana Valona ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months straight for this massive buffalo hunt. Well, 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion, and also not one buffalo was hunted, nor seen. 
Great plan. At number five, Queen Batman. Batman, he is justice. We know this. Well, long before Batman, there was a queen who sought vengeance and she did it in the most brutal way. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed because her son was just too young to rule yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she had to do the most that she could with her power while it still lasted, and so she used her powers as monarch to seek justice for her husband's death. She was able to get her husband's killers captured and killed using scolding water, but she soon developed a thirst for suffering apparently and she just kept on going after people. She would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. So if you ever breathe in the general vicinity of the guy who offed her hubby, you could kiss your life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that her killers were from, she devised a plan to bury their tribe's leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we know is that she definitely was not okay. Number four, tomb alignment. Nobody knows angles like ancient Egyptians. The way they built the pyramids, I mean, they still stand today confidently. We're trying to figure out just how they made the pyramids in the first place. Meanwhile, there's a team inside the pyramids trying to figure out who is even buried in the walls. It's a whole fascinating mystery. Using ground penetrating radar, researchers were able to find this corridor, this log opening in the bedrock at the exact same depth of King Tut's chamber. And on top of that, these openings are facing the same direction. Tomb KV-62 and this new chamber have the same orientation, so of course we're going to believe that they're connected. Because unconnected tombs don't often align, or don't ever align really, so that's also a sign. We're getting close. Let's just give me a shovel. I'll get in there. I'll help out. Be so gentle with everything. I'll feather things off. I've seen national treasure. At number three, Evil Empress. This next empress is pretty similar to Olga of Kiev, whom I talked about earlier. Empress Wu Zetan also had a thirst for blood and suffering, but not towards people who have necessarily wronged her. You see, when she came into power, she was determined to keep that power by any means necessary. So she had all of her rivals killed. So anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The empress ordered the execution of the previous empress, as well as members of her own family, including her own newborn daughter. She didn't want to risk anyone taking away her power, including her own offspring apparently. She didn't hold back on the methods of eliminating her rivals either. Yeah sure, she could have just done a one two stabby stabby and called it a day, but that's no fun. Instead, she had people poisoned, strangled, mutilated, or even burned or boiled alive. Good soup. Eventually, she retired from her part time job of sending people back to their maker and started spending more time with her lovers and getting addicted to aphrodisiacs. People weren't quick to forget about all that bloodshed though, and so to get back at her, they had all of her lovers killed and the empress was exiled. She got a little too greedy and karma came back with a vengeance. Number two, Ice Palace. If you're a fan of the film Frozen, this next one is gonna get you jazzed right up. Anna Ivanova, the Empress of Russia from 1730 to 1740. Okay, so in celebration over their victory with the Ottoman Empire, Anna gave the order to build an ice house, this massive ice palace. Best place to cool down if you ask me, I'll leave. This ice palace was pretty impressive. If I was there, I would 100% lick the walls. Obviously, someone definitely did, you know that for a fact. 20 meters by 50 meters, and even more impressive, there were ice trees and ice birds sculpted inside. How magical is that? Anna arranged this marriage with a prince and one of her maids. Now, they didn't know each other, they were forced to ride an elephant, and all the guests were dressed up like clowns. Yep, yeah, that's all valid, that's all accurate. You heard me. You may be thinking, wait a minute, Taylor, an ice palace in Russia, was that maybe cold? Yeah, it was an absolute nightmare. Anna made the guest party all night, freezing cold. They all got sick, dressed like clowns. I went to an ice hotel in Quebec once. Spoiler alert, it's cold and boring. There, I just saved you $70. You're welcome. And finally, at number one, Gladiator Games and Chill. If you didn't ever have to go to work and you could just lounge around all day, what would you do with your time? Really, anything could be possible. You could be like the Bruno Mars lazy song. Well, there's one empress from back in ancient Rome who occupied her time with the company of others. Apparently, Empress Valeria Messalina was famous for her exploits. Since she was empress and she had all this time and money and no one to tell her no, she took full advantage of that and bought a house, turned it into a brothel, and made that her side hustle. A lot like Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. Though she had a collection of women who worked there, she also was known to invite upper class ladies to participate in the 
nightly escapades as well. And don't think that Valeria did jump in as well. She was considered to be quite something in the sack. In the wise words of Ludacris and Little John, she was a lady in the streets, but a freak in the bed. <laughs> The Empress was known to be such a hardcore participant that she would win games where they would compete to sleep with the most men in one night. One time she won the round after being with 25 men. One night. She did the absolute most, but at least she was having fun. Number 10, history. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti aka the Lady of Grace aka Hereditary Princess was born in 1370 BCE. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes and she was only 15 years old when she married the 16 year old Akhenaten. She worshipped the sun god Aten and alongside her young husband she built a new capital city called Armana and she also created a new religion so how's that. She ruled over what's considered the wealth wealthiest period in Egypt history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters, which may have had something to do with why we don't know much about her today, but I'll get into that much later on. Number nine, her death. After changing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished, just like that. And on this video, we're gonna try and figure out what may have happened to her. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's legacy. She was gone from everything. Many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather she disguised herself and continued to rule. The next in line after Akhenaten's reign was the pharaoh Smenker. Was that really Nefertiti in disguise? I hope so. That would be pretty sweet if we proved that and figured that out. I'm really rooting for that. The reason we believe that she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh, Hapshepput, because they ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century. It's known that they had a big traditional fake beard. It's cool. It's like kind of flashy. I kind of want one. I can't grow a beard or a mustache, so I kind of want a fake one myself. Lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. We've gotten closer to uncovering the truth, though, recently in 2015, when Nicholas Reeves and Mamdu El Damadi found what they think is a hidden doorway in King Tut's tomb that contains perhaps the sarcophagus of the lost queen. I'll get into that shortly, but first we need to talk about her modern day origins. Number eight. Berlin bust. Perhaps one of the most popular ancient sculptures of all time was found on December 6, 1913. German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt found this on the floor of the Royal Sculptures Workshop. This figure has some unforgettable details. I mean, first of all, she's breathtaking to look at, and the blue headpiece. These are all important. It was clear that this was Queen Nefertiti from the start. The German team split everything with the Egyptian government, so currently, this bust is being held in Berlin. It draws in about 50,000 visitors a year to Berlin's newest museum a little piece of Egypt all the way over there. We love it. Now, fun little fact about this modern bust. In 2009, there were scans done to it. Technology, nice. And it's revealed that underneath this painted layer is limestone carving of a woman so detailed that you can see wrinkles in her cheeks, even a bump on her nose as well. That's very, that's like 4K Egypt. It's crazy. Back in 2016, these two artists secretly 3D scanned the bust of the Lost Queen and then straight up released the files online as a free download. The future is here, I guess. Also, that's that's a little invasive. Just scanning your head, like that's really? But three years later, officials decided to release that to the public, so here it is, take a look. The Queen Nefertiti, 3D bust. Scanned by James Bond secretly. Number seven, Monuments Men. It wasn't always a smooth ride for this specific bust. Sometimes it was a bust. I had to, I had to, why not? She spent 11 years in the private residence of Germany's expedition founder, Jacques Simon. Cut to nine years later, that's when King Tut's tomb was discovered. A totally separate event, unbeknownst to them, connected. Howard Carter found King Tut's tomb in 1922, and of course afterwards, the entire world was watching. Just a year later, her bust was finally moved to Berlin. It had a rocky go. It remained in Germans' hands throughout the entire war. Even that big ugly dude with the little mustache said that he himself would never relinquish the head of the queen. So thanks, Spittler. I can't say his name because YouTube. It was hidden in a salt mine throughout the entire Cold War. The Germans would arrive too late though sometimes when stealing rich pieces of art. Like in 1940, for example, they arrived at the Louvre and it was bare. The Mona Lisa was now in a child's bedroom. Curators had moved the pieces, thankfully. But when a bust of a long lost queen of Egypt was being held in a salt mine in the town of Merkers, the monuments men literally saved history. When Sergeant Kenneth C. Lindsay led his team down the 35 miles of tunnel, and aside from the queen's bust, billions of dollars of gold was also found down there, all stolen from the Germans. Number six, 
hidden chamber. Ancient Egyptian architecture is mind-blowing. Even to this day, we're trying to figure out how exactly everything was built. More and more secrets are coming out of all these hidden tombs. It's fascinating. Technology is for sure a helping hand when it comes to learning about our past queens and kings. And for Queen Nefertiti, her final resting place is now believed to be in a secret chamber in King Tut's tomb. This was years ago. Egypt tourist minister Hisham Zazu said the discovery was like a big bang. And I see no lies. It's perhaps one of the biggest discoveries of the 21st century. After radar tests were conducted, Conducted, Egyptian officials were 90% sure they found a hidden chamber and it was also full of treasure So that's neat and also we're onto something number five original plans another theory that surrounds the Queen is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. Yeah, listen to this. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. What's compelling here though is that King Tut passed away at age 19. So many believe his own burial chamber hadn't even been built yet, or finished at least. So instead, they used hers. But a radar survey around the tomb in the Valley of the Kings shows us this hidden chamber behind the north wall of the burial chamber. It's been said before that King Tut's chamber was way too small and there must be more. His stepmom being buried in the same tomb, well, that's certainly a start. We're on to something. Number four, Catherine Howard. Queen of England from 1540 to 1541. Such a short amount of time, but why? Being the fifth wife of King Henry VIII, cousin to Anne Boleyn, referred to by King Henry as his rose without a thorn, he just gave her all the gifts and she was just 19 years old. Sounds great so far, but you know, because of his list, things won't end up well. Their marriage didn't even last a year until rumors, not letters or eyewitnesses, rumors started spreading about infidelity. There was a small amount of evidence that suggested that she had been romantically involved with somebody beforehand, so a jealous mad king got jealous and mad again. Shocker. You had me at fifth wife, I don't know. She was executed for adultery and treason at the Tower Green on February 13th, 1542. Number three, brief ruling. The queen was the stepmother of King Tut. Her daughter was married to King Tut. So there's a handful of Egyptologists that believe that right before King Tut's ruling in the 14th century, there was this really small window where Nefertiti ruled as Pharaoh. There's also a great deal of historians that believe Nefertiti was no ruler to her husband, King Akhenaten, but we don't have enough evidence quite yet to really know what happened. Hence why we're doing a mystery video on the long lost queen. Now we get it. The reason we're adamant on finding everything we can is because she literally changed Egyptian religion. Number two, her family. The queen's name translates to a beautiful woman has come. And given the fact that we still don't know her parentage, we have to use our national treasure brains here. A beautiful woman has come. Come from where? Well, early Egyptologists believe that Queen Nefertiti came from Syria. Back then, it was Mitanni. Her family roots are still debatable, but there's reason to believe that Nefertiti was actually Egyptian born. In fact, many believe she's related to King Akhenaten. We don't really know. The lost queen did have children of her own. She had six daughters, like I mentioned before, two of which became queens of Egypt. She may have also been the daughter of A, who at the time was an advisor for the king and ended up becoming Pharaoh after King Tut's death in 1323. So we have no idea, but we're getting so close. I feel like we're like years away from finding everything we need to know, but also, this last point is pretty interesting. Number one, sun god origins. Okay, one of the most interesting facts about all of this was the religious impact that the queen made on ancient Egypt. Both her and King Akhenaten were in a cult. How fascinating is that? They were in the cult of the sun god Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time. There have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Theban tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, so definitely her, part of these sun god rituals. So cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. She made a new god. She convinced everyone to believe in a new god. That's incredible. We can't even decide on who's gonna win America's Got Talent. She's like trading in traditions and religions. That's wild. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Empress of Austria. The saying wrong place at the wrong time couldn't be used more in this case. Empress Elizabeth of Austria, she was sadly taken out by somebody who just wanted to attack a royal. He didn't have anything against Elizabeth per se, this man was an Italian anarchist named Luigi Luceni, and that fateful day, September 10th, 1898, he took the Empress's life. In his own admission, Luigi stated that he had nothing against the Empress on a personal level at all. See, what had happened was he intended on taking the life of the Duke of Orleans, but when Luigi arrived a little too late in Geneva, the opportunity to do so had passed. He looked at a local newspaper, saw Elizabeth, and found out where she was staying, and he waited for her to leave that hotel. That's how easy it was. People are so creepy. Keep an eye open. If you're a queen, keep your eyes open. This is scary. Number nine, 
royal curse. The remains of Polish queens and kings were discovered back in April 1931 in a crypt in Vilnius. Polish researchers didn't even know what they were in for. I mean, a storm had flooded a cathedral and they threw down sandbags to preserve the area, but on the night of April 25th, they had followed the water into this lost chamber that held the remains of Polish kings and queens. These remains, with the crown still attached, might I add, were from the 15th century. What a find, right? Well, sadly, the remains were all over this flooded tomb now. It wasn't really in one spot. It was horrible. And now after these discoveries, that's when things got really mysterious. Those involved in the findings began to die off in unusual circumstances, one after another. And it happened pretty quick, too. One professor had died after falling down a shaft in his apartment. He had a heart attack. An engineer had died before him as well due to undisclosed medical issues. Okay. Another professor years later who worked in the crypt as well became paralyzed at age 62. A sculptor involved died when untying his shoelace. Just the weirdest way to go out. That's the only details that we know. Just, I don't know, use your imagination I guess. Maybe he fell and hit his head. That's sad. It's tragic. And another professor died in 1936 shortly after visiting the crypt as well. I sure hope this isn't an ancient curse because these guys were trying to preserve their history and avoid the crypt from flooding. Like, I don't know, we need a Ouija board to clear this whole thing up. We were trying to help you with the sandbag. Number eight, Queen Caroline. In a list of unusual ways that people have died, odds are it's going to get a little gruesome, a little messy. After all, that's why you click this video, right? Right? Some ancient queens die natural causes and then history remembers them for their reign. In this case, history remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she died. It was written in an epigram from the 18th century from a poet named Alexander Pope. It, he wrote down, here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. It rhymes? Like, come on, man, you didn't have to do this. This is horrible. That's like a prank almost. I can't believe somebody was like, yeah, 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 write that down. That's good, that's good. Did it rhyme? Yeah, she'd like that for sure. R.I.P. Number seven, Anne Boleyn. The second wife of King Henry VIII. Yes, we have a few on this list. She was found guilty of treason and she had been charged with having sexual relationships with five others, including Lord Rochford, AKA her brother, George Boleyn. Yeah, the uh, ancient days were a little bit odd. She had also apparently had relations with Sir Henry Norris, the king's close friend. And when I say close friend, I mean he was the groom of the stool, so they were tight. He literally would wipe his So on top of this, Anne was also found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. Now, it's since been proven that these crimes were a bunch of rubbish, basically. Anne wasn't even present when these events went down. She was still recovering from the birth of her daughter, future Elizabeth I, so there's no way in hell she was fooling around with the groom of the stool in October 1533. All five guys involved were executed on Tower Hill in May 1536, and then two days later, Anne joked about her little neck before being taken out with a sword as well. There wasn't even a coffin for her burial. So Somebody had to go and get an old elm chest from the tower armory. They used a chest to bury her body near her brother, Lord Rochford. A chest. Horrible. That's so horrible. Number six, Mary Queen of Scots. If you're a murderino, this one's pretty juicy. Listen up. Back in 1565, Mary was determined to take the throne for herself. When Mary was just six days old, her father, King James V, had passed away, so she ascended to the throne. She was about to marry the King of France in 1558, but he passed away, so she returned to Scotland as the country's monarch. Her next plan was to marry her cousin, Lord Darnley, so now, if something were to happen to Elizabeth, Mary would be yet again lined up for the throne. That cousin ended up dying in a random explosion, and then years later, in 1568, Queen Elizabeth had welcomed Mary after she fled to England. So Mary was close, but now what? Well, Elizabeth had found out that Mary was involved in English Catholic and Spanish plots to overthrow her, so she was then placed on house arrest. Fair, more than fair, more than fair. Cut to 19 years later, 1586, a letter had emerged revealing that Mary was involved in a plot to have her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I, killed. She was then sentenced to death and her head was taken off for treason. History is dark, my friends. Even if you're family, it's, shit gets crazy. Number five, Charlotte Augusta. Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales lost her life in 1817. And when I say ancient, this is probably the most recent that I'll go, because I know ancient means way back. I gotcha. But I have to include this one, because as far as royals go, she was loved at this time. She ended up falling in love with Britain's Prince Leopold, but a year and a half later, she died giving birth. She was healthy at the time. She was only 21 years old when this happened. Charlotte was lined up to be the queen one day, and historical accounts say that the doctors here were at fault. Charlotte's tragic passing had vendors running out of black fabric. That's how rock the public was right after this. Just massive displays of grief. What do you guys think? Comment down below. Was this a doctor conspiracy or just 
classic medieval times, it's the olden days, we can't really do as much. Let us know. Number four, no crust. This next one, honestly, I stand by. I see no wrong here. Queen Elizabeth II, still rocking to this day. She's been known for a few funny, quirky queen things. Like one of my favorites, for example, she has somebody on payroll who breaks in new shoes for the queen. Every time I buy Vans, my ankle always does that little foot rub. If only I were a queen, damn it. But we're talking about unusual things here. And one of the weirdest things I've ever heard is that the queen has refused crust on her sandwiches. This has been a no-go for about 150 years. It's not recent at all. You might be thinking, oh, maybe she's old. She can't chew her jawbones. Nope way back. This goes way back for no reason. Right around the time of Queen Victoria and her husband Albert. They viewed anything square shaped as bad luck because it looked like a coffin. I've never thought about death while eating grilled cheese, but now I definitely will. Thank you. This must be a pretty scary job, cutting the crust off the queen's bread. My hands would be shaking the entire time. Also, diagonal or down the middle? Let us know. There's only one right answer. Number three, Catherine Parr. When Catherine Parr got a position in Princess Mary's house in 1542, she met King Henry VIII. She was smart. She was 30 years old, so it was a step in the right direction age-wise when it comes to these queens and King Henry. Not that there's anything wrong with marrying somebody younger. That's not what I'm saying, but it's just, well, look at this list. All these people died. Spoiler alert. So the older, the better, at least. I don't know. She was seen as somebody who could nurse the king in his dying age, so the public liked her. She was the first English queen also to write and publish her own books. Now, come 1543, Catherine gave up her man, Thomas Seymour, to marry the king. The two got married that July at Hampton Court Palace, and from that point on, her beliefs were deemed dangerous. Queen Catherine was a supporter of the English Reformation, and Catherine's religious opponents were plotting against her, and they tried to convince the king that she was dangerous. Her arrest was even planned, everything was kind of going in a bad direction. And then Catherine went to King Henry right away and then asked for forgiveness herself. You know, for pushing her views too far many times before, and he forgave her. Meanwhile, others are losing heads for having relationships. Okay. Her and Henry were married for five years, and then after his death, she married Thomas Seymour just a few months later. And then come September 1548, she died after giving birth to her daughter. The account of her death comes from a lady-in-waiting and friend of Catherine Parr, comes from Elizabeth Tyrant. Only her account is fishy because she never liked Thomas Seymour to begin with. She made it seem like Catherine was speaking about her husband in a negative manner when she was dying, and this is the only time in history where that's ever been an idea. So what do you think? It's like broken telephone, but hundreds of years ago. I'm like, I, maybe she was friends? I don't know. Sounds like a conspiracy. Number two, Anne of Cleves. Where to even begin here? Okay, this one is sad, man. Anne was right in the middle of Henry's wives. She was married to King Henry for six months, and it was seen as quite strategic in a way. Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's Duke of Cleves, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, Henry requested that Hans Holbein travel to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister. This is like the birth of Tinder right now. I'm not joking, this actually happened. This man compared portraits and then chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. She was compared to the silver moon. Yeah, try that on a dating site. I praiseth thou beauty, madam. Super swipe. A treaty was signed and a few weeks later Anne arrived to England. Henry was beyond upset because she looked nothing like she did in her portrait. Yep, real life, this is what really happened. He tried to stop the wedding because of this, but it was too late. They had to follow through and they got married on January 6th, 1540. And later accepted the divorce because obviously a divorce was in play after what you just heard. And then she lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Of all the ways to be remembered in history, King Henry made this horrible for Anne. And finally, number one, Cleopatra. Last of the Egyptian pharaohs and last on our list. One of the biggest questions to this day is just how Cleopatra died. What happened? It's been rumored for a while that a snake bite was the culprit, but many believe that Cleopatra also allowed a poisonous snake to end her life. They think it was a bite from an asp. But there's also a large amount of historians that also believe that she poisoned herself using a hairpin. Her lover Anthony fell on his own sword, but Cleopatra, she just poked herself. She barely lost blood. Now, as a young in, we have to note that Cleopatra was brilliant. She was also interested in learning specifically about chemistry. So this theory about her poisoning herself doesn't sound very far-fetched. Until we find her body, we'll really never know. What do you guys think? Number 10, Queen of the Nile. For me, it's fun to think about the day in the life of an ancient Roman or Egyptian. 
I can only hope it was as beautiful as textbooks, movies, and video games make it out to be. But something that I find interesting is that the Egyptians were using makeup all those years ago. Yes, that's right, Cleopatra being the bougiest of all the queens to ever grace our presence, or at least so Elizabeth Taylor would make me think so, had her fair share of makeup use. However, something that may not be fit for a queen was the Egyptian eye glitter. Oh boy, here we go. To achieve this, colorful insect beetles were crushed up and added to an applicable powder, where you would then brush that on your eyes. Look, bugs don't gross me out, but I don't exactly know if I'd want that all up in my business. To be fair, we shouldn't be grossed out because uh, I hate to tell you, but there's some products we still use today that might have a cup or two of bugs in it, just saying. Number nine, Royal Bite. It would be difficult to specify a queen who had this done, as there are probably simply too many. And it's more of a, well, service, I guess, than a product, but hear me out. Something I'm just extremely fascinated in and frightened by at the same time. Taking place in Africa, Asia, and the South Pacific Islands. Your dentist's worst nightmare. Teeth sharpening, ooh. Considered to be a thing of beauty. Many women, and even recently, have undergone this process of jungle dentistry. I for one cannot judge someone else's culture, however, I can judge the experience of acquiring such a look, and I know that just can't be fun. You ever get a cavity removed at the dentist and buddies just drilling into your tooth like John D. Rockefeller looking for some oil? Okay, well imagine someone filing your teeth down like a high school woodshop project. Yeah, no thanks. I get shivers just thinking about it, and all that blood and the powdered teeth just piling up in your mouth, and there's no suction thingy? Nah, that's just the worst, man. Nah, I, that ain't it. I talk to the chief, he's a dentist. That, that ain't it. Number eight, shampoo. What's better than having a hot shower after a long day and just, just rinsing off the woes of the day? Honestly, it's one of my favorite things. For me, a nice hair wash feels good with my favorite shampoo. And because I'm a guy, my body wash, shampoo, and conditioner are all the same product. It's what we do. However, queens of the Inca civilization had more lucrative beauty products, to say the least. I say product because this was a process. What am I talking about? <laughs> Fermented urine. What else, of course? Yes, that's right. The Inca's favorite way to combat those dry scalps was the forbidden lemonade. That's just gross. Don't drink that. They would have clay pots filled with the golden broth, and then it was cast aside to really let those flavors come together. Or at least I think that's what's happening. That's something a chef would say. Anyway, once it reached the desired level of fermentation, it was then used to clean hair. Oh man, what a way to make a queen stay fresh. Just message to the Incas. Just stick to soap, man. Don't do that. Imagine just like having a just one just, oh, just, it feels so good. Oh, it smells great. I love this. This is fantastic. I love, this is so great. I love this. Number seven, Empress Irene. Kings, queens, emperors, and empresses. Chances are these folks are related. It's a family thing. A mia familia. You know what I mean? It's how it goes when you're the king and you need a son to continue the lineage. Even though I would like to argue that if you're gone, you're gone. So who really cares who's taken over? Just my opinion. Speaking of eye gouging, Oh, wait, I didn't mention that before. I made a segue, but okay, that's all right, bad segue. Well, the, the topic of discussion here is Empress Irene. Basically, her son was taking too much power for himself. She was losing hers and yada yada, and his eyes were gouged out from two guards ordered by his dear sweet mother. Can you blame her though? I mean, come on, he was threatening a rule. She worked so hard to get there. The chief was just silent on this one. Chief had no words for that one, guys, no words. Number six, cowboy action. Okay, not exactly a queen, but pretty close. Hear me out, guys. Sarah Winchester was the widow and the heiress of the Winchester rifle fortune. This included $20 million and 50% of shares of the company. Man, I wish that was me. And in case you didn't know, the Winchester rifle company was responsible for making guns good when a lot just weren't. And that model of rifle unfortunately took a lot of lives. So it's said that the Winchester mansion was haunted by the ghosts of the poor souls who found themselves at the business end of a repeater. Sarah allegedly was missing a few cards from the deck. All sixes and nines, just, just a little crazy. So in her craziness, it's fair to say she spent some time with a Winchester rifle or two, which is quite a scandalous product for a queen who thinks she's seeing ghosts. Plus. Women back then, besides Annie Oakley, weren't supposed to handle things like that because it was the 1800s and men were just really mean and stinky and come on guys, give her a break. I ain't that woman can't shoot a gun. What are you talking about? Number five, toxic eyes. 
It's no mystery that beauty products today can be filled with all kinds of lovely chemicals that make you look great. And there's tons of products from the past that could be labeled as scandalous. Well, how about putting literal poison in your eyes? Yes, that's right. Back to the women of Eolde Europe, the very same queens with the pale skin wanted eyes that sparkled. How to achieve this? Well, you just put drops of belladonna in, in your eyes, which, if you didn't know, is poison. Like, just straight up poison. It's bad. It would dilute the eyes, and that was considered beautiful. If you think that sounds like it's bad for your health, that's because it is. Long-term exposure to the belladonna drops would lead to blindness. Yeah, kind of a trade-off there. Good looking eyes, go blind later. Yeah, no thanks. Number four, the neck stretcher. No, that is not a WWE wrestler or finishing move, although it really sounds like one, it could be. No, this is something I've always been fascinated with, really, it's just kind of out of this world. I'm talking about neck rings from some African and Asian cultures. Basically, over there in some cultures, the more a woman looks like the Kaminoans from Attack of the Clones, the better. And that means it's time to stretch the neck by slowly placing rings around a young woman's neck until it grows. And then you keep slapping those bad boys on until you've got so many rings on your neck, it'll make you say Sifo Dias. Had to fit a little Star Wars in there somewhere. Truth be told, the neck doesn't actually stretch. It's more the shoulders are dropping from all that weight, which can weigh up to like 15 pounds or something. It's crazy. And if common folk take part in this lengthy procedure, the most beautiful of queens certainly did too. Number three, this, this makes no sense. Look, with all the crazy, super awful, weird things that humans have done, at least most of the time in my opinion, there's a method to the madness. Poisonous eye drops do make your eyes pretty, sure. The urine shampoo does get rid of my dandruff, okay. But with this one, I mean, there's just no way. It, it just doesn't make sense. And I would have no idea how to present this to royalty, especially the queen of the Nile. Toothpaste made from mice, yes. Just how though, I, I, it doesn't make any sense. Like how was a mouse supposed to make your breath feel fresh over some herbs and nicer smelling things? Basically, you cut the mouse in half, like that's a normal thing to do, and then you put that in your mouth. Also, have you ever tried catching a mouse? That's not easy. Is there a mouse farm? So many questions. To me, it's just a really bad look to have the queen swishing around half a mouse in her mouth like some of Listerine's finest mouthwash. Ugh. Number two, blondes have more fun. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a popular hair color. And believe it or not, I used to have natural blonde hair, like super blonde. And then Harambe left this plane of existence and my hair got darker, cause life got darker. Now all I wanna do is listen to MCR in my room and write in my journal about how nobody understands me while MTV plays on the TV my parents bought me in the background. Some people wanna go blonde. This was true of royal women in ye olde times. So time to reach for some good old fashioned hair dye right off the shelf, right? Let's read the ingredients together. Water, well, that's good, okay. <laughs> I got a water. A lead, well I got tons of that on my face already, so that's fine. Was this, sulfur? What? Yeah, that's right, that's <laughs> sulfur. Imagine slathering that stinky goodness all in your locks. This was something that the highly esteemed Tudor women actually did, or at least tried. I feel like you need a whole truck of this stuff to work. But then again, the smell. That's not how a queen should smell, is it? It's not right now, you shouldn't, it's not. Number one, the Canary Girls. When Great Britain was at war, the queen was a symbol of their freedom and democracy. True British strength to keep on carrying on. So the next time the queen goes to visit a munitions factory to cheer on the women who are working hard day and night for the war effort, she might want to keep her distance. The high explosives used in the artillery shells, famously known as TNT, I'd break down the scientific name, but we all know <laughs> my track record with reading. <laughs> I can't. It is a very volatile substance, but not just for the explosive capabilities, but it's also toxic. Yeah, I didn't know this, I learned this. Very similar to the radium girls of the same fate. TNT with enough exposure can turn skin and hair a yellowy orange color. Now, we can't have her royal majesty showing up somewhere looking like Big Bird, can we? To avoid being a literal blonde bombshell, perhaps stay away from the factory, your royal highness. Number 10, moving in. I don't know about you guys, but when I think of old Blighty, I think of royal prestige. London and Buckingham Palace. After all, that's what a queen needs. You gotta have a palace. Where's my palace? Although most people think of the queen living in Buckingham Palace, Queen Victoria was the first of the royal family to do so. I'm not royalty, but I wouldn't mind crashing a few days there. Nice big place, servants, probably all you can eat. Man, she had it good. All that's missing is Wi-Fi. Move over, your royal highness, I'm moving in. Just gotta get my collection of Sailor Moon memorabilia. Number nine, queen jeans. 
No, not a nice pair of royal jeans. I'm talking about DNA and hereditary genes. I've mentioned a few times on this channel how the royal family may or may not have been uh, inbreeding. Okay, who am I kidding? There was a lot of inbreeding going on. Sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, cousins, and of course, hey step bro. Now as lovely as that seems to some, unfortunately, crossing the hall to reproduce can have ill effects as inbreeding is known to have complications with birth and their offspring. Well, Queen Victoria may have been the first carrier of hemophilia B, a blood clotting disease. While not having it herself, it's thought she passed it down through royals related all throughout Europe. Tsar Nicholas II's son comes to mind. However, I feel like if we told the royals why people were contracting certain illnesses, they would still do what they want anyway. So I'll just close the door. Door. You guys can go ahead and do what you're gonna do. <sighs> Number eight, breaking tradition. For men in Western culture, it has been a long time of bending the knee to propose to the woman that you love, or so wish to swoon. Tammy Lynn, I don't got much, but I know I got this ring I found behind a Chuck E. Cheese. So what I would like to do is I Jim Bob Billy Abernathy, I'm asking for your hand in marriage. So romantic. Anyway, bad jokes aside, you'd be wrong in thinking that's how it went for old Blighty. When the young monarch met her cousin, Albert, the love juices were flowing. She knew she was gonna have to lock him in and propose to him before he could get the chance. They were shortly married soon after, and as stated in her diaries, it seemed that the couple was truly in love, which for royals is kind of rare. Even today, it's usually men who propose to ladies, but all I'm gonna say is, ladies, I'm 300 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal, and I put the toothpaste lid back on after brushing my teeth, so... Number seven, foundation. Sometimes all a girl or a queen needs is a little foundation. After all, who doesn't want to have a gorgeous glowing complexion? Especially if you're a queen. The royalty of ye olde Europe felt the same way, except their products were a little different than to what a queen would have today. Some products are hard to pitch and market, but this... Uh, this would be even hard to market in a Super Bowl commercial. The queens of ye olde Europe fell into a trend of having pale skin. So, to achieve this mixture, it was a mixture of lead and vinegar to coat the face that gave the desired pale look. That just sounds awful. Talk about scandals. Our queen's makeup makes her smell like she's been working away in a lead mine all day. Naturally, this couldn't have been pleasant, but a girl's gotta do what a girl's gotta do. Beauty is pain, and sometimes it's really stinky. Number six. Oh, Christmas tree, oh, Christmas tree. I was honestly shooketh when I learned this, but you know that thing a lot of people do around the holiday season where they get a big green tree and they like decorate it because of the holiday called like Christmas? I mean, you might have heard of it. Yeah, I've never heard of it either. Bad jokes aside, the queen and her husband may have popularized the Christmas tradition of decorating the tree after sending trees to local schools and army barracks. An image of the family decorating the tree was also published that Christmas. I wonder if they popularized any other traditions as well, like your aunt drinking too much wine, and that one uncle, no matter how many times he's told, says something at the dinner table that would have him sitting in HR so fast that, well, he'd, he'd be sitting in the HR office for saying something like that in public. Everyone's got an uncle like that. Number five, the terror of London. If you're into serial killers and just a little goth or emo, I mean, who isn't, then you know who Jack the Ripper is. If you don't, he was a serial killer who roamed the streets of Victorian England and killed multiple women of the evening and what can be called the first, or one of the first, modern serial killers. Jack the Ripper, however, is one of the psychos who got away. No one is 100% sure on who the Terror of London was. However, that hasn't stopped people from theorizing on his or her true identity. No, not Queen Victoria herself, although there are some who believe he was a woman, which would explain how he got away so easily. However, another popular theory is that it was the Queen Victoria's grandson, Prince Albert Victor. While there isn't much evidence to support this claim, or any of the claims really, it is interesting and makes me wonder, maybe the royal was a killer? We'll never know. Number 4. Short Kings Unite! Even though I'm a semi-charming and moderately handsome internet host, I suffer from an illness a lot of men do. I suffer from shortness. When the Lord was making me, he just put a few extra drops of cute in the mix. <sighs> and then there was no more room for my legs to grow. 
I just see life from a little bit down below. Although, I own it, and thank God I don't have little man syndrome. All toxic jokes aside, Queen Victoria may have been a good fit for us short kings, as she was barely five feet tall. She's known for being a formidable queen, but when you're that short, it can sometimes be difficult to keep your stature. Somebody take me seriously! Number three, dollies. Okay, so maybe my Sailor Moon merch collection is weird. Maybe I just want to be a cute blonde Japanese girl with a short skirt fighting evil. <laughs> Can you blame me? However, something I always find strange, no matter who it is and who owns it, is a doll collection. Why? Just why? And it's never a couple. It's always a large collection. And tell me why anytime you go to visit someone and stay overnight, they always put you in a guest room where the majority of the dolls reside. There's nothing like a hundred pair of creepy plastic eyes staring you down while you're trying to sleep in a bed that isn't yours. Well, Her Royal Majesty had her own collection of dolls. Yeah, that's right. You can just imagine the kind of treatment these dolls received. It's said she had hundreds of them, and most likely wore higher quality clothes than most common folk at the time. Great, now my worst nightmares outnumber me, and they're dressed to the nines. Whew, dolls are just creepy. Number two, here comes the bride. Imagine being so powerful, so mighty, and influential that you create two Western traditions. Sure, the Christmas tree is great, but I'd argue the white wedding dress is more. She wasn't the first to wear a white wedding dress, but she was the one that made it happen. There's a few reasons why, and the obvious one is flexing that royal coin, but imagine trying to keep pure white clothes clean in the past. My mom makes a mean spaghetti and meatballs, and I have a difficult time keeping those stains off my white t-shirts. Which, if you also ask my mom, is a bad color for me. I was a messy kid. That's why other colors at the time made sense. After all, there's no dry cleaning in the 1800s. At least not with modern machines and stain remover. Hey Alexa, can you add stain remover to my list? Number one, send lewds. Despite being known as a somewhat prudent queen, apparently the queen had an eye for the art that was lewd. In one case, the royal husband and wife gave each other art. She got some nice work, and uh, he got some nice works, if you catch my drift. We all know how nudity and lewd imagery can be treated by those who wish to censor it. Queen Victoria felt the opposite and had somewhat of an appreciation for the human form, even commissioning a lewd painting of herself. At least lewd for the time, it was more like a wrist and ankles kind of thing, but. Number 10, Marie Antoinette. I wonder what it must have been like to be the Queen of France. To sit in a palace and eat all those delicious foods that your cooks can make while the peasants outside struggle to eat and sing about bread for some reason. I don't know, lay Miz reverence. It's a life of beauty, balls, and not listening to what the stinky peasants outside have to say. Except that's the very reason why Marie Antoinette was the last queen of France. You can only spend so much time and money on your exuberant lifestyle before the people get fed up. I mean, these people have nothing. It's kind of difficult to control people when they don't even have food at home. They let the queen know how upset they were when they decided to remove her head from her body. Number nine, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary. Sometimes it's just in the name, isn't it? Like Mario, you know that he's an Italian plumber. Or Luigi, you can tell that that's an Italian plumber's brother. And uh, King DDD, king of the DDDs or, or something, I, I don't know. Okay, maybe the names don't always give it away, but Bloody Mary does. Most known for her liberal use of the wooden stake and the whole uh, burning folks alive thing. I, I wish I could tell you it was for barbecue, but it was actually for some more serious religious persecution and, and reformation. The Catholic Church was hot, but the witches and heretics burning at the stake or hotter, no cap. Number eight, Reina Valona of Madagascar. This one is a new one for me. Didn't know about this, but here we go. So basically, Queen Reina, I'm gonna say, I'm just gonna call her Queen Ravioli because I can't pronounce it. Basically, Queen Ravioli takes over from her past husband. She says to herself, how can I make things better? Oh, I know, how about I become a ruthless, bloodthirsty, unaliving tyrant? Great idea, right? Yes, very uh, not great success. Yes, unfortunately, she did many heinous things. Something I found out to be particularly interesting, however, was her destroying the many good things her husband had set up before her. Madagascar had some European intervention, and while it's true that a lot of times that is a bad thing, and yeah, it's a bad thing, and it does bring some bad stuff with it, however, it also brings a lot of good things with it. In Madagascar's case, it was markets, modern schools, trade, and diplomacy with, with Europe, and that's, that's good, money's good, you like that. Well, the queen wasn't having any of that, so she reformed. 
And by that I mean she repressed and and re unalive people. Number seven, Queen Isabella of Spain. Queen Isabella is known for a few things. A lot of stuff YouTube probably doesn't want me to talk about. Insert religious persecution here. However, I think she should be remembered for something else. Something rather strange. When I was a kid, I would run around outside for hours, oftentimes ending up in the mud. My mother would always say, it's time to hose you down, son. And she wasn't wrong, because I, I probably needed a good hose down. Now, regardless of how much dirt was behind my ears, I didn't want to wash. I was this big stupid kid, can you blame me? I was proud of the scruff, but that's because I was going to have another wash most likely within the next 12 hours. I always got hosed down at some point. Queen Isabella, however, boasted to others that she only bathed twice in her life. Sweet Lord, Mary Mother of God woman, that is not something to boast about. Due to some water access issues, the Catholic Church was like, ah, baths? Who needs them? You know what? Baths are sinful anyway. Being so close to God, so she doesn't bathe. Cleanliness is next to godliness, except in that time period where not bathing means you're actually closer to the big JC upstairs, so that's how it goes. Number six, Fu Hao. Another woman in history married to a man in the stinky patriarchy. Worst, except Fu Hao didn't want to be wife 57 of 64. She wanted more than that. And to be honest, I think that's fair. You go girl, who wants to be wife 57 of 64? Maybe some people in Utah, I don't know. What's maybe slightly more unholy than having that many wives is going on an epic military campaign and raging war in the Shang Dynasty. A warrior queen, if you will. We know some of this history based on her tomb as she was buried with ceremonial weapons, knives, blades, swords, some dogs, some uh, human sacrifices, gold, money, jade, and lots of other valuable goodies. Just makes you want to loot all the stuff in there, doesn't it? I mean, Jade's pretty cool. This was a common practice amongst male warriors back then, but you know what? Good for her and all that unaliving. Way to go, sister. I like it. Very nice. Okay. Number five, Tamiris. Honestly, every time I face her in Civilization VI, it just ends badly. I'll spend a few turns building my economy or maybe organizing some troops, and I look back over at her cities, and she's already amassed a massive army and is ahead in science. Yeah, I'm not the best Civ Six player, but sheesh lady, come on, give me a break. This probably has something to do with her real life counterpart. Tamiris was a woman who lost her son to Cyrus the Great. So she said to herself, I don't know what's so great about this Cyrus guy. There's a trailer park voice reference in there somewhere. Just imagine Ricky telling Cyrus off. I don't know, you, you gotta find it. Basically, after losing her son, she gathered the troops and commenced battle. The almighty Cyrus met his end, which given how the way women were treated back then probably didn't go over too well with PR. Yeah, well, she got her revenge though. Number four, the Trung sisters. The Trung sisters are double trouble. You're getting two queens at once here. China was being down bad and trying to conquer some things that maybe they shouldn't have. Naughty, no. The Trung sisters came to answer the call. These girls are actually revered as heroes still today in Vietnam. But what they were able to do for so long was very impressive. China had a very impressive army, no surprise there. And Vietnam was a much smaller country or kingdom, I guess you'd say, and their army was not as impressive. But the sisters managed to hold them off for three years. Three years with their forces. That That is crazy good. That is very impressive and perhaps a lot of bloodshed too. Sadly, the sisters waded off into the waters before they could be captured because after that long fighting, I wouldn't want to be captured either. Number three, Grace O'Malley. Have I seen land lovers? Ye be looking for Grace O'Malley. Well, then ye come to the right place, sir. Thank you, thank you. That is my private impression. I will be here all week. Bad impressions aside, Grace O'Malley wasn't a traditional queen to be fair, but what she didn't have in regular queen qualities, she did make up for that in being a badass pirate. Nice. This is another one where I'm gonna ask Hollywood for a movie, please. Irish Pirate Queen? Come on guys, that's just a movie begging to be made. Grace O'Malley was a fierce pirate from the age of 11 and a wise woman who ruled the seas after her father's passing. I don't really have much to say after that, to be honest. I'll just wait for Hollywood to make their move. And maybe you can cast me in there. And I can put on some long red hair and some boots and I could, I could swim and just put the red hair on me right now. I just look so good. <laughs> Number two, Queen Victoria. Okay, hear me out on this one. This one has more to do with their lineage per se than her, but it's 
her somewhat to blame. Okay, so Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, King George V of Britain, and Wilhelm Kaiser II of Germany were all first cousins. Their grandma was Queen Victoria. What? I, I know, right? Isn't that, isn't that weird? Yeah, it's weird. Imagine how crazy your bloodline has to be for that. And, you know, the fact that during World War I, all three of these cousins were at war with each other. I mean, that, that's just insane. I mean, families fight, sure, but come on, man. Get the mustard gas off the table, bro. Come on. That's cheap. Just don't. Number one, my mom. My mom, I love her so much. She, she's the best. But man, sometimes, oh, she's so unfair. I had to do chores when I was a kid, and I had to put down the toilet seat. And worst of all, she made me put the little toothpaste back in the tube when I was done with it. Oh, I mean, come on, right? Not like she ever did anything for me, like birth me, feed me, raise me, clothe me, and love me unconditionally. And now I gotta make my bed? Oh, this is the worst day ever. I'm sure no other cute boy with blue eyes like me ever had this problem. Ugh. Number 10, queen of hating her daughter. Starting off this list with a bang would have to be the utterly despicable Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg, the queen of Sweden. Queen Maria here seems to be guilty of the crime of attempted delifing. That's a pretty crazy thing for a queen, but it gets even crazier when you find out it was her own daughter who she tried to do this to. For some reason, when the queen gave birth to her daughter, who she wanted to be a son, she instantly thought of her sweet, innocent little daughter as a dark and ugly monster with black eyes. Gotta love coming into this world and being hated purely for existing. As she saw her as a monster, Maria tried to have her daughter dispatched multiple times, and I don't know what this crime would be called, but she even forced her daughter to sleep next to the rotting corpse of her own father. Maybe that's the true crime here, because this is messed up. Number nine, don't mess with the empress. The only powerful female emperor in the history of China has got to make you extremely ruthless, simply because you are a target and you would have needed to work to get to where you are. And you know what? Wu Zetian, who ruled during China's Tang Dynasty, was quite ruthless. She took her position of power by force, and she slayed many people in order to do so. But she didn't stop there. She committed more acts of slaying throughout her rule as well. And I don't mean like slay queen, although that does really work for this list, but no, she slayed people. And we don't support that kind of criminal behavior, even if you are above the law. To make matters worse though, it is reported that even her mother and grandchildren fell onto that list of victims, all because they were against her. Truly a ruthless queen. Number eight, mommy issues. Empress Irene of Athens ruled between 797 to 802, and she co-ruled with her son for two decades before leaving it all by herself. That's not a crime, but how she did so was a bit more, I don't know, just a little outside the realm of legality by today's standards. Her son, Emperor Constantine VI, was not a popular emperor, and the empress was quite an ambitious and greedy woman. She wanted full control of the Byzantine Empire, and to do that, with the help of some political allies, Irene led a conspiracy against her own son. Poor parenting skills if you ask me, but hey, the two actually made up and were at least somewhat civil. That is until Constantine divorced his wife and married his mistress, turning the people against him and giving Irene the opportunity to lead another conspiracy and then have her son's eyes gouged out. Yay! Number seven, Rana Valona. I honestly didn't know Madagascar had queens or kings. That's not because it doesn't make sense, I, I'm, just, I'm just dumb. Thanks to me being a young child, I thought the only royalty Madagascar had was King Julian. You know, like the lemur? King Julian! Like that, that King Julian? Um, but they did have kings and queens, and one of these queens was pretty damn brutal. Queen Renavalona I ruled Madagascar between 1828 and 1861, and there is absolutely no doubt that she would do anything for her kingdom. After King Radama I, her husband, passed away, she took over the crown, and during her reign, she put a lot of people to the axe, or whatever way they executed people in Madagascar. Her uncle was one who met the sticky end to protect her power. But some records state that Rena Valona ended her own mother's life by subjecting her to starvation. Rena Valona sent her mom to her room and didn't let her have dinner. Or any meals, really. That's never okay. And would get someone like us charged under the law with something. I don't know what exactly it would be, but it'd be something. Number six, pretty firmly against cheating. 
Not to be weird, but I can kind of see where this queen is coming from. At first. At first, I sort of get it, but not later on. Just at first. Henry II of France had a lifelong affair with his mistress, Diane de Poitiers. And even while on his deathbed, he begged his own wife, Queen Catherine de Medici, to allow him to see her. Kind of really disrespectful to your wife, but I guess he loved his mistress too. I, mm -mm. I'm kind of confused on the morals of this. However, the queen was not confused on the morals and didn't give in to his plea. In fact, she even denied Diane entry into the room, letting the king pass away without having his dying wish granted. Damn. That ain't a crime. This queen had a daughter who took after her dear old dad when it came to the whole monogamous relationships, meaning she didn't really have them. When the queen mother found out about her married daughter's new romantic interest, she locked her daughter up in a castle and never saw her again. But she became even worse when she ordered her daughter's romantic interest to be executed in front of her. Now that is rough. And while she didn't do the deed herself, giving the order is kind of bad enough. It gets worse. Her son, King Henry, didn't like that she cruelly did this to her own daughter, so she had him dispatched as well. My goodness. Number 5. Bloody Mary Duh. Mary the First, or Bloody Mary as she is also known, was the first real Queen of Britain. But this reign didn't last very long, five years to be exact, before she was replaced by the much, much better Queen Elizabeth. But in that short five year span, Bloody Mary earned that title, let me tell you. Mary the First ordered war against the Protestants and slew quite a hardy handful of them for heresy. Which is interesting since her father, Henry VIII, was kind of the guy who made Protestants more of a thing in England and then her sister was also Protestant and made it the main religion in England. History is full of people needlessly passing away because what they believe isn't the right thing. Anyways, to heat things up, Mary even had some of these Protestants burned on the spot. Some is kind of an unfair statement. You see, the Queen here was responsible for burning over 300 Protestants at the stake. Other kings and queens burned people at the stake for their faith. I mean, Mary's father did it, as did her sister. But it's the sheer amount of people that make her much worse and much more famous. Number 4. Taking over Queen Catherine the Great of Russia was obviously a Queen of Russia. But that don't mean she was actually Russian. She was actually German born. But she was Russian to get herself into power when it turns out her husband, Emperor Peter, was not very liked by his own people, as he showed a very obvious dislike for Russia, which is kind of weird. She took advantage of people's disdain, and while she may not have directly done the life ending here, it is pretty well stated that the act was committed by her supporters, and public opinion held her responsible. She was called the Great, but it seems she was actually kind of the absolute worst, even if she was a strong ruler. She does look very proud of herself in a lot of her paintings though, which, I mean, she overthrew her own emperor husband and became ruler of a country she isn't even native to. So like, yeah, I guess, good job, I think. <laughs> Number 3. La Loca the Loco Finally, a queen not on this list for ending other people's lives. No, Juana la Loca was far worse than that. Not to be insensitive, but Juana la Loca was loco. She was the Queen of Castile from 1504 to 1516, and she suffered from various mental disorders. After her husband died in 1506, her father buried his body, but that didn't stop La Loca from opening the tomb and caressing her husband's non-living body from time to time. Ultimately, she even ordered people to dig up the body fully, and she would kiss her deceased husband's feet. I'm sorry, excuse me, I need, I need some water after that. That's disgusting. Mm, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh good, we aren't done. Of course not. No, no, apparently, Juana would also carry his coffin everywhere with her and even kept it under her bed. It wasn't until years and years later she allowed his burial outside her window, finally. Look, I, I get loving somebody, but dear lord, imagine what she was like when he was alive. Stage 10 clinger, 100%. Number 2. Let them eat cake. How about a queen that caused a whole revolution? That's gotta be a good one. We have almost all heard of Marie Antoinette. She was well known for splurging on things she shouldn't have and the countless affairs and scandals she was involved in. Like the scandal of the necklace. Countess de la Motte pretended to be the queen's friend and entered the French court in 1785. 
She fooled a member of high society in believing that the queen loved him, even going as far as to hire a lady of the night, disguise her as the queen, and convince the poor guy that Antoinette wanted to purchase a diamond necklace that cost 1,600,000 livres, which is almost 12 million dollars by today's money. The amount of sheer greed and debauchery that happened while she was around made her own people rise up and fight back against the unfairness of the French monarchy. Good job, you made your people hate you, cause y'all ignorant. Number 1. Countess Not Dracula? Born in Transylvania, because of course she was, in 1560 Countess Elizabeth Bathory of Hungary was a Hungarian noblewoman. But more than that, she was an extremely infamous serial slayer. She used her position of power to defend herself from ever having to suffer the consequences of the heinous crimes she would commit. Okay, well, name the crimes, Adam! Okay, I will. Elizabeth spent years slaying servants and peasants just because she wanted to and enjoyed it. She did it so much that her own husband, Count Nadasti, went so far as to build his wife a torment chamber for her to do this more comfortably. Great husband, horrible person. Elizabeth also had a nasty habit of actually feasting on her prey. She would often bite and eat chunks out of them while they were still alive, and in one case, she may have even forced someone to cook and eat some of their own body. Eventually, her conduct became so appalling that a trial was held. It only took forever to happen. She was convicted on 80 counts, but was only sentenced to solitary imprisonment within her castle. That's it. Like how is that okay? I don't get it. She thankfully met her end three years later in 1614, but my lord was she a bad dudette. Not good. Number 10, Marie Antoinette, Madame Deficit. The last queen of France and maybe the last time royals got away with, well, being royals. Her whole existence was opulence, which is really just salt in the wound, when most of your citizens probably can't even afford a portion of salt because they're broke or because there's food shortages. Wasn't a good time. But if you looked into the royal palace, you can bet she's got a pantry full of bread and a bowl of fruit just ready for the pickings. She even had the nerve to purchase a necklace that if through today's inflation would be worth 12 million dollars US. Ooh, that's a lot of money I wish I had. People were starving, and honestly, if people don't have anything, including food, ooh, it's not gonna be a good time. Imagine a whole country acting up because they haven't had their Snickers yet. Well, that ended up sparking a revolution. Very confusing, and in all that confusion, both the king and queen lost their heads. Wasn't good. Number nine, Queen Victoria. Oh, blighty. Man, it must be nice to have a whole era in history named after you. Maybe I'll get one one day. The cheddar time. I don't know. She's, I don't know. Big Ched? We'll see what happens. Queen Victoria had some strange quirks about her. One that I can almost get behind, but not quite, is her niche for eating fast. Maybe too fast. I'm a guy who likes to make things simple, easy meals. The faster I can slip into a couch with an ice cold beer and a movie, I'm a happy guy. And or enjoy said food with the movie. Queen Victoria liked her meals to last no longer than 30 minutes. That means while you're on the appetizer, she's on the main course. And while you're on the main course, she's ordering coffee. Look, I respect the hustle. I get that. But maybe this is too much. That being said, are you going to be the one who brings it up to her royal majesty? Listen, if you want to see tomorrow's five minute brunch, you better keep it to yourself. Number eight, Cleopatra. Don't we all miss Elizabeth Taylor? I know I do. Sometimes, I wish I was her. Oh, she's just beautiful. Can you blame me? I honestly wish I was the real Cleopatra too though. All that power, and to not have one, but two Romans wrapped around her finger. Ooh, she was the last pharaoh of Egypt, but maybe had the most drama. Sure, Elizabeth Taylor was the most beautiful and chic woman in all of Hollywood, and she may or may not have had a few men wrapped around her finger too, but she never had to deal with the world's largest empire and her own throne all whilst managing to stay the most beautiful and chic. I can barely manage to toast toast in the morning. Never mind all those affairs and, um, well, the marriage affairs too. There's a lot of, a lot of affairs happening. Huh? Huh? Number seven, did you miss me? Queen Victoria was a leader. She held a lot of power and that means 
people sometimes got a little crazy and wanted to remove her from such power. So for Queen Victoria, it should be no surprise, however uncouth it was, but she had multiple assassination attempts on her life. A lot of which were people firing shots at her carriage for some reason with, with a pistol. And a lot of these attempts leading people to being declared insane. And one specific amateur who tried multiple times to end the royal and failed every time. Eight times to be specific. I feel like after the first four times when the guard saw this guy approach, it was like, oh, man, this guy again. Oh, brother, this guy stinks. Anyway, all attempts to end her life failed, and she became the second longest reigning queen. Next to Queen Elizabeth, of course. Number six, Queen Elizabeth II. No crusts. Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch. God bless the queen. And God save the queen. Shout out to the UK. Chetty loves you. How you doing? Come, come and see me sometime. I love you guys. Now, sure, she's not the most awful, spoiled queen in history, but she is a queen, and that does mean she can have things her way. Like, for example, all of her sandwiches have to have the crusts cut off. Yes, just like children. Yes, just the way I like them too. No, I'm not a big baby. I'm a big, strong man who totally doesn't rely on the women in his life. <laughs> no, what are, you, what are you saying? Dude, stop. Mom, I love you. Anyway. Well, yes, it's true, the queen's sandwiches have to have her crust cut off. Is it the worst thing ever? No, I don't think so, but what if her sandwich showed up with crust? We don't really burn people at the stake anymore, so what would she do? Would she fire them, I guess? It's kind of a little thing to get fired over. I don't know, anyway. Speaking of getting fired. Number five, Empress Irene. Mother dearest, most people have fond memories of their mothers. Maybe you should call her, I'm just saying. Mother's Day happened, you should call her. Empress Irene was a woman who wanted power. Honestly, who doesn't? We've all got a little bit of Sith in us, yes. Her son, who had naturally inherited some of her power, was growing stronger by the day. Now, maybe it was ego, maybe it was envy, maybe her son just took down her live, laugh, love signs. I'm not sure. But Irene was not having any of it. So when her son least expected it, she had two guards apprehend him and had his eyes gouged out. Now, being that this was before 2022, this was a critical medical injury. And after nine days of grueling pain, and what I'm sure it was a lot of blind confusion, the injury proved to be fatal. So what's the lesson here? Uh, blood is not as thick as water? Ah, I don't really know, it's just messed up. Number four, Queen of Castile. Life can be tough sometimes, especially when we lose the ones we love the most. Everybody deals with things differently. The Queen of Castile is a person who deals with that, well, very differently. People passing on was no rare occurrence back in those days. There's a thousand reasons on how you could wind up six feet under. When the Queen of Castile's husband passed away from the disease of the month, she was devastated. Rightfully so, that's rough. However, that being said, sometimes Sometimes you gotta take that with a little grace. For days she would not leave her husband's side, even after he was a cold cadaver. Later on, that corpse would travel with her, apparently even stopping a carriage once to get out and kiss his feet. It's weekend at Bernie's except a lot sadder and gross, and uh, not a charming 80s movie. Ugh. Number three, Carlotta of Mexico. This is a new one for me, but an interesting story nonetheless. Basically, France wanted a piece of Mexico, and I mean, come on, who doesn't? It's gorgeous. Carlotta was a Belgian princess who kind of just married into the royal family and got plopped down in some chaos in Mexico. There was a war, enough political strife, to make anyone involved in the Watergate scandal start to look for documents. It was messy, it wasn't a good time. It got so bad that she had to go back to Europe and basically made the call that all university students have to make after fraud. Week. Hey mom, uh, dad, uh, listen, um, yeah, I'm, I'm great. Uh, do you think maybe um, you could send me some money? Yeah, I, I need some help. Except her phone call wasn't like that. Her phone call was more like, hey, European nobility, uh, can you come please save my husband because he's about to get de-lifed and like stabilize the country? Thanks, spoiled princess calling, hi. It didn't work out in the end. He got de-lifed, she went back home and uh, well, she went a little crazy. Number two, Elizabeth Bathory. Serial D-lifers, your queen has arrived. I think this one is one of the more interesting cases in history. Usually when you think of a creepy D-lifer, that lurk of the night, you think of Gacy, Dahmer, you know, guys like that. It's not very often that it's a woman and or someone from before the 19th or 20th century. That's just how it goes. I'd also argue perishing and manual D-lifing was a part of life back in medieval times, so kind of hard to quantify what is and isn't a serial D-lifer or life taker. However, I think she counts. The body count is estimated to be somewhere in the hundreds, and a most peculiar rumor is that she bathed in the blood of her victims. Ooh, that's gross. Bathing in water. 
that checks out. Bathing in mud, you go to a spa, that checks out too. Bathing in beer, sticky and strange, but check, I've done it. Uh-huh, I one time I did that. Bathing in blood, mm, that's a no cow zone for me, chief. While the bathing in blood thing might be false, the evidence of her crimes uh, were not. Imagine being so spoiled you can hide bodies. Mm. Number one, Queen Mary. Henry VIII was a big bad dude who wanted it his way. He wasn't the Burger King, although by looking at him you could tell he was uh, packing a few of those bad boys away too. No, he was the King of England and he had many wives and was spoiled himself. So do you think his children grew up humble and wise? Nay, kind sir and madam. Queen Mary took the throne a few years later and wasn't happy with the Protestants. Ugh, too many she said to herself. Well, if you've heard us talk about her before, she'll probably come up again time and time again because, well, she cooked those people on a wooden stake. Over her reign, countless people felt the fires of her wrath, hence the name Bloody Mary. Number one is context on the missing queens. Lexi de los Santos, a Nat Geographic promoter, perfectly describes the treatment of Egyptian queens. Out of all the ancient civilizations, Egypt was the only one that really valued women, but after their rule, male leaders just erased all memory of these women because they didn't want them to have all that success. But why would ancient men in a culture that respected and revered women still strike them off the record in a fit of primal jealousy when they've been regal. It was best explained in the recent Bumblebee video, Top 10 Messed Up Things That Happened to Women in Ancient Egypt. It's the blame game. In ancient Egypt, pharaohs were supposed to be the human incarnate of the gods, but one thing that the male gods, female gods, and human females all had in common was the truest power, the womb. The ability to create and birth life, Ra's greatest creation. All of mankind came from Ra, the king god, yet any man who sat on the throne as Pharaoh, meant to be the incarnate of Ra, was missing that one true power. So what that meant is any time a female Pharaoh took the throne, she was more akin to the kink god by the Egyptians own definition than the male Pharaoh ever could be. Call that a mic drop. Consequently, if the womb wielders had a built in facet of power that you can't regulate, recreate, nor have for yourself, chances are you're gonna be pretty snubbed. So if she's also a better ruler than her male counterparts, you're going to be resentful. Unfortunately, this means the documentation of many queens is lost to time. Their stories coming to us in broken pieces of pottery and papyrus, on ancient word of mouth from Greek and Rome, or from unidentified mummies that come and go as the sands blow thanks to the jealousy of mankind. Leader number nine will be Kenti Hase the first. So who was the first woman to rule Egypt? This will be the biggest debate of the video as there are technically three qualifiers. First candidate is Kenti Hase the first. She was born circa 25 550 2520 BC and died sometime between 2510 and 2490 BC. The remains of this female leader were undisturbed for two millennia within her necropolis until its excavation in the 1930s. And since its discovery at Giza, her tomb has intrigued historians and archaeologists alike. The mausoleum is as grand as other pyramids of her predecessors and includes a solar boat, a chapel, granaries, and a water tank. A small structure known as the washing tent of the female king had been built in front of her temple and here the body was washed and ritually purified prior to being embalmed. Her mastaba is believed to have been the final royal tomb that was constructed at that necropolis and many scholars believe that it was strongly connected to the pharaohs of the 4th and 5th dynasties. On its granite doorway her formal title is construed to be the mother of the king of upper and lower Egypt, holding office as king of upper and lower Egypt. In support of the latter title is her image which is altered to show her in a kingly pose including the false beard, the royal Uraeus cobra crown, and holding a scepter, one of the many adjustments and additions made up until the 6th century, implying that this pharaoh possibly had continued a role in religion and worship after her death. Kenti may have ruled as a regent for her presumed son, Sahur, possibly in conjunction with Yusarkaf, the founder of the 5th dynasty. However, despite the fact that she was apparently considered an ancestress of the 5th dynasty and was commemorated in the mortuary chapel of Absur at Kenikartes II, her name has never been found in a royal cartouche. Leader number eight is Mernith. Among ancient Egypt's greatest female leaders was Queen Mernith, who had the overwhelming ambition to rule a country and stopped whoever shared that sentiment. Her name means the beloved Neith, the daughter of King Dier, and beloved she seemed to be, until after she died and then the men 
didn't have to respect her anymore, that is. Even if she wasn't the first woman to rule Egypt, she definitely seemed to be. But if historians want to debate endlessly, who am I to stop their fun? She definitely was the first woman to rule anything in known human history, because she was born about 3,000 years ago. Merneith stepped in as regent after her husband's death as their son, Den, was too young to rule at the time. Karakuni, an Egyptologist, said that these women were often used as protectors. Men would put women in high positions to keep young male leaders safe and give them time to mature. When a man was ready to take over as pharaoh, the woman in charge would step down. But Bernice was Old Kingdom Egypt, and when she assumed this tutelage, it was in despite of what religious traditions of the first dynasty decreed, that only men were to rule. Despite that, Bernice stood rigidly by her son for a full decade, from 2939 to 2929 BC, until he became one of the most prominent kings of Old Kingdom Egypt. Despite the fact that there are few records of her name in any tombs, her accomplishments in life, she's still believed to have been a figure of great power and simultaneously respected and despised. Either way, she's one of those pharaohs that was buried alongside 50 live servants. Leader number seven is Nikokris. The third and most mysterious candidate for the first female king of Egypt is recorded many centuries later in the work of the Egyptian historian Manitho. Her name is Nikokris, and she was believed to have lived around the 22nd century BC, which was towards the end of the 6th dynasty. Some have suggested that Nikokris was the last pharaoh of this dynasty. As Manitho tells us, she built the third pyramid and reigned for 12 years, but the whole third pyramid thing is an absolute disaster. If you know anything about ancient Egypt, there's just so much BS around the king's list and the dynasties. We don't know who made it, and every time we think we do, someone else shows up in history and has it attributed to them. So, it's up in the air. Herodotus also mentions Nikokris, but in the colorful context that she had killed hundreds to avenge the Egyptian king, who had been slain by the people in a coup, and who happened to be her brother. The people had given the kingdom to Nikokris to rule after doing so. The story is, is that she had constructed an elaborate underground dining chamber under the guise of it being for her coronation, inviting all those she knew to be responsible for her brother's death, as well as anyone who knew of the coup plan, but did nothing of it. This includes servants, concubines, officials, priests, the whole shebang. As the banquet progressed, Nikokris, surveying safely from a platform, had her servants open the floodgates and let the flow of the Nile River into the chamber through a concealed pipe, drowning all in attendance. To quote Herodotus, that is all the information I was given about Nikokris, except that afterwards, she threw herself in a chamber full of ashes to avoid retribution. Leader number six is Sobenekfru. It's not until the end of the Middle Kingdom that we find for the first time 100% pure, clear evidence of a female king. So, her name was Sobenekfru, and there are about five variations of her name, all harder to say than the last. However, the name Sobenekfru means the beauties of Sobek in reference to the crocodile god. One, that the rulers of the 12th dynasty established a religious and economic center in Fayum 4, where crocodiles were nurtured and worshipped. Queen Sobenekfru rose to power after the death of her brother slash husband Amenhotep the fourth which made her the eighth ruler of Egypt's 12th dynasty and she went on to rule for nearly four years that was a lot of numbers in one sentence so I hope you're keeping up though missing her head in many the queen statues found in Fayum show that she appeared to combine masculine and feminine aspects of regal dress similar to many other female rulers of Egypt she is the last ruler prior to the new kingdom to appear in the offering list found at Abydos and Sekera which does suggest just some kind of posthumous verdict that separates her from the kings who follow her with equally short reigns. How Sobenekfru died or where she was buried remains a mystery. Some have suggested that her burial might be in one of the pyramids at Mazgana, but this is very unlikely, as is Amenhat's Labyrinth or Herkeopolis, both of which she contributed to. Thus, one of the most powerful women of the early world history remains a mystery. And speaking of, Miss Victoria gave the progressive prime ministers endless hell. While lapping up the flattery of her favorite prime minister, Benjamin Disraeli, who famously admitted he laid it on with a trowel, she never hid her intense dislike of William Gladstone. His approach to the PM role was progressive social policies and she absolutely hated it. And his proposed plan for Irish home rule, which she considered a threat to her empire. Any name she could toss, she would. A mischievous firebrand, arrogant, tyrannical, obstinate, half crazy, wild, incomprehensible old fanatic. More than a few observers sensed there was an element of jealousy in her animity towards the people's William. He was always more liked than she was. When Gladstone 
Gladstone won the 1880 general election, she announced to the world she would abdicate the throne rather than accept him as prime minister. Then offered two other liberal grandees the job who insisted Gladstone had to take it. Then she tried to force him to weed out the members of cabinet she didn't like. He refused. Her interventions failed to prevent her cabinet from achieving what they were determined to do, but she could wear them down. One of her prime ministers said handling her was like having a whole separate government department to deal with. Leader number four is Amos. Amos was the principal wife of Pharaoh Thutmose the first in the 18th dynasty and the mother of Hatshepsut, who went on to become one of Egypt's greatest pharaohs. She had many titles, king's great wife, king's sister, hereditary princess, great of praises, and mistress of the two lands. However, it appears she is a rare occurrence of a primary wife not being of royal blood, which would explain why her probable son, Prince Amen Mones, was not mentioned in the Sebian mortuary chapel of Wadmos, which attests her husband's secondary wife and her sons. The whereabouts of Amos's tomb and mummy remain unknown, likely one of the many lost to pillaging and weird Victorian unwrapping parties. However, Stella found in a defu that once belonged to an official called Yuf remains a testament to her existence. He recorded that the Queen Amos appointed him as an assistant treasurer and entrusted him with the service to a statute of Her Majesty. Amos owes a lot of thanks to her daughter, Hatshepsut, however, for plastering her face everywhere. As you'll learn in the next segment, Hatshepsut dedicated herself as a demigod and so put up many etchings and murals of her divine conception, the image of the god Amun approaching her mother, Amos, or some more compromising images of the two together. Good for Amos catching a god's attention. Leader number three is Hatshepsut. So from mother to daughter, let's talk about this train wreck who was also the most influential and long ruling Egyptian queen and was known to be a great diplomat during her 22 year reign. She is also regarded as the first great woman in recorded history. Hatshepsut was only the second known woman to assume the throne as king of Upper and Lower Egypt after Queen Sobanekfu, whom was the model for this pharaoh as a queen and whom she based many of her decisions upon. Upon Thutmose II's death, the throne was passed to Thutmose III and Hatshepsut, who was the aunt and stepmother, acted as regent until simply just taking the crown herself. Like pretty much every Egyptian queen short of Cleopatra, Cleopatra had he dressed in men's royal garb, wore a false beard, and created statues of herself with the pharaoh's headdress. During the seventh year of her reign, however, she went even further and asked to be depicted as a man, ordering to be referred to not as a queen, but as a king. Hattie surrounded herself with strong and loyal advisors, her favorite being the royal steward Senemut, who many believe was having an affair with the queen. The evidence for this claim is the fact that Hatshepsut allowed Senemut to place his name and image of himself behind one of the main doors of the Dieser Dasu, which is rare, and, and an unusual share of credit. That and plenty of graffiti made by peasants and workers depict the two in compromising positions. Not kidding, ancient R-rated graffiti. Anyway, Hattie's reign was peaceful, a time where many monuments were erected, of her, of Amun, who she claimed was her lineage was based off of, of Bastet, maybe a few more of her, you know, to be humble. However, after her death, her successor, who was possibly even her own stepson, attempted to erase all record of her, destroyed statues, burnt documents, attempted to remove her presence from Egypt. This effort only half works, while we don't know much as we wish we could. Hatshepsut is still remembered to this day. Leader number two is Nefertiti. This is the queen married to the cult guy who was so hated in Egypt that everyone agreed to ignore that he had ever happened. Unfortunately, it means this beauty had her name tarnished in the process, call it canceled by association. That's why Taylor Swift broke up with the problematic singer guy Maddie. I think the name alone is worth the breakup. Why are you in your mid thirties but still going by Maddie? Nefertiti's name can translate to a beautiful woman has arrived and that she had from parents unknown. We haven't figured that part out. A life-size bust of the queen was found in 1912 and is her most famous image and depiction, and it shows she really was a stunner. To the extent it's believed that ancient Egyptians revered her as a fertility goddess embodied. However, other Egyptian art depicts Nefertiti in ways normally only pharaohs are shown. For instance, she's portrayed smiting enemies, such as on a ship, raising her right hand to kill female prisoners, a depiction often seen on male pharaohs. Additionally, the type of helmet-like crown Nefertiti is wearing in the bust is typically reserved for pharaohs or the goddess Tefnut or Hathor. One idea is that after Akhenaten's death, Nefertiti's power and popularity was so great she was able to rule as pharaoh in her own right. Egyptian records mention a figure named Neferen Fatuen, who ruled Egypt for a brief time. Like how actors took stage names, pharaohs actually took throne names and it's speculated this was the throne name for Nefertiti. This means our girl was on the throne for three years. But as you know, after her reign, the Egyptian people tried to wash her away to the best of their abilities. Took Mahan, 
undid Akhenaten's religious reform, Armana became abandoned, and images of Akhenaten and Nefertiti are destroyed. Where leader number one is Aset. You may know her by her Grecian name, however, Isis. She was the queen mother of all gods. Her name quite literally translates to queen of the throne, which is reflected in her headdress, which is sometimes a literal throne. However, sometimes it takes on traits from Hathors or Mutz to represent her assimilation with other women in the pantheon. While she seemingly started as a side figure to her husband Osiris, she was quickly transformed into the queen of the universe and an embodiment of cosmic order. By the Roman period, Aset was believed to control fate and linear existence itself. This is accredited to the story of Ra's secret name, where an Aset is able to find out the true name of Ra, something no other god knows, and ultimately makes her his equal, if not more powerful than he. Aset was the sister and wife of the god Osiris, ruler of the underworld. It is said that she and Osiris were in love with each other even within the womb. As he was king of Egypt, Isis was queen, and one who supported her husband and taught the women of Egypt to weave, bake, and brew beer. Set was always angry with this relation, as Isis reigned over the land of Egypt in the wake of the traveling Osiris instead of Set. She was stronger, and, and he regarded this with jealous eyes as well as the good works of his brother, for his heart was full of evil and he loved warfare better than peace. The queens frustrated his wicked designs, so he sought in vain to prevail in battle against her and plotted to overcome Osiris by Gal. This is how the famous story of Osiris' death, Horus' birth, and the grieving Aset prevails as one of Egypt's most famous stories. Set tricks Osiris into the coffin, which he tosses in the Nile. The grieving Aset refused to accept this and searched far and wide as a fugitive, birthing their son Horus on the journey. When she finds a coffin, she returns it to Egypt. Unfortunately, Set finds it hidden again and dismembers Osiris, scattering the pieces. Isis still refuses to relent. She finds the pieces and entombs them. Anubis, with the assistance of Thoth and Horus, united the severed portions of the body of Osiris, which they wrapped in linen bandage. Thus, the origin of the mummy form of the god. Osiris then became the judge and king of the dead, residing in the underworld, as Isis remained with Horus on the above. Queen Victoria was anti-women's rights. Ah, isn't that fun? Queen Victoria, who ruled England from 1837 until 1901, was in the perfect position to be the forerunner for the women's movement. Meanwhile, she's up in her office writing letters stating that the movement of the present day to place women in the same profession as men was mad and utterly demoralizing. She stated a woman's place was in the home and also condemned the idea of a woman becoming doctors or any career. In a letter written by Victoria to her uncle Leopold, king of the Belgians, she wrote that her husband Albert grows daily fonder of politics and business and is wonderfully fit for both. And I grow daily to dislike them both more and more. We women are not made for governing, and if we are good women, we must dislike these masculine occupations. Y'all, the queen wrote that. In 1850, the queen was faced with the Women's Franchise Bill passing in Parliament and began a very lengthy correspondence with Prime Minister William Gladstone, letting him know about her strong aversion to these so-called erroneous rights of women, and that she felt so strongly upon this dangerous, unchristian, and natural cry and movement of women's rights that she is most anxious that Mr. Gladstone and others should take some steps to check this alarming danger. Let woman be what God intended, a helpmate for man, but with totally different duties and vocations. Yeah, it didn't age well. And if you're doubting me, let's take a look at this petty beef. Queen Victoria was not for the girlies. She was a bitter and jealous B-word a lot of the time and over many different things. One was Lady Flora Hastings, lady-in-waiting, but also very close friend to Victoria's mother, who in 1839 presented herself to the Queen's doc with abdominal pain and a severe gut swelling. Lady Flora had been part of the royal household during Victoria's upbringing when the young heir to the throne was subjected to a strict system of rules and regulations that left her isolated isolated and unhappy. The queen still harbored that grudge against Flora because of her association with this bleak time and also her mother, who Victoria had serious mommy issues for. Anyways, Flora was unmarried, so the immediate visual symptoms led to an assumption she was preggers, out of wedlock. Demon ass Victoria rebels in this opportunity and she has former governess baroness, Lezen, obligingly spread the rumor that Flora is pregnant. Since Victoria suspected the father was a much hated guardian from her childhood, Sir John Conray, she threw that into boot. Hastings is publicly humiliated, forced to protest her innocence, and undergo a gynecological examination, which proved, in fact, she was not pregnant. Her swollen stomach was due to advanced liver cancer, and she died a couple weeks after. Conroy and others spearheaded a press campaign to slam the queen and her fellow conspirators for smearing and defaming the Lady Flora. It dented the young queen's popularity, and at Flora's funeral two months later, the people quite literally dented her carriage when they stoned it. A lot of hypocrisy, especially from a woman of many 
many lovers, one of whom was very obviously John Brown Scandal. The worst day of Queen Victoria's life, the day her husband Albert died. The second worst day of Victoria's life, when her loyal servant John Brown died. John Brown served as the Queen's constant companion and he pledged to be with her always. After the death of Albert, Victoria relied on her devoted manservant from Scotland for everything. Victoria's children referred to him as mama's lover, naturally, due to the fact they slept in adjoining room. Heated gossip naturally made its way around, why Brown's shocking informal manner with the Queen and his high-handed rude ways with other royals seemed to suggest his closeness with Victoria, in the words of one contemporary insider, was contrary to etiquette and even decency. Speculation that the two secretly wed came out when the Queen's chaplain claimed on his deathbed that he performed the ceremony. There was also talk of three additional hidden children. Premarital relations between John Brown and Victoria are a possible marriage, it's never been proven. However, when Victoria died, she requested a photo of him be placed in her coffin, along with a lock of his hair, some of his letters, and his mother's wedding ring he had gifted her. When Victoria died, her son Edward had any statuary destroyed or removed that talked of Brown. He also had 300 letters of his mother's burned. The British monarchy has been known to be better than the KGB at covering up its scandals and destroying evidence, and Abdul Karim is a great example. The portrayal of Karim in Western biographies is that of a rogue who manipulated the queen for wealth. Naturally, that's the classic British racism that brought us colonialism. Abdul was only 24 when he arrived in England, but Queen Victoria was smitten by the young man's intelligence, charm, and seriously hardcore work ethic, and admittedly his height. Victoria upped his status by making Abdul her teacher in the language of Urdu. In return, he introduced her to curry, Urdu writing, and even hookah. That's right, they were hot box and castles, guys. The court was meanwhile repulsed. Abdul was Muslim and supposed to be a servant, and yet he was closer to the queen than anyone else in her immediate circle. Four decades his senior, Victoria brought Abdul with her on all her trips and treated him as a close companion. While a romantic relationship is insanely unlikely, the queen was signing her letters as dearest mother to Kareem, the two surely had a special bond. The English courtiers hated him, and Victoria chose to ignore that snobbish and racist behavior by forbidding it. Naturally, it doesn't make it go away, but it means it didn't happen in her presence. In her final wishes, she was quite explicit. Kareem would be one of the principal mourners at her funeral, an honor afforded to the monarch's closest friends and family. Victoria could not control what happened to the Munshi from beyond the grave, but she did everything in her power to mitigate the treatment she presumed that the family would inflict. Queen's fear is justified. Upon her death, Victoria's children worked swiftly to evict her mother's favorite advisor. Edward sent guards to the cottage Karim shared with his wife, seized all the letters from the queen, and burnt them on the spot. They instructed Karim to return to India immediately, without any fanfare or farewell, and Victoria's daughter Beatrice erased all reference to Karim in the queen's journals, an effing commitment given Victoria's decade plus relationship with them. The royal family's eradication of Karim was so thorough, a full 100 years would pass before an eagle eyed journalist noticed a strange clue left in Victoria's summer home on a tour. Her consequential investigation led to the discovery of Victoria's relationship, the worldwide attention of it, the novel, the movie, and the finding of his heirs. Meanwhile, when the queen didn't like you, it was back to the usual political agitation and request denied. In 1822, after a few small time jobs in the Tory governments over the years, Robert Peel became Home Secretary, where he famously established Metropolitan Police Force for London and reformed criminal law to reduce the number of offenses punishable by death and educate prisoners. In 1834, three years before the events of Victoria, Peel became Prime Minister of a minority Tory government. Those governments struggled to pass legislation against the majority rival Whig party and eventually resigned in frustration after just 100 days or so in power. Then in 1839, Peel got the chance to form the Tory government by Queen Victoria, but he asked in return she replaced the Whig ladies of her household with Tory equivalents. Said ladies in waiting were her friends and many were married or related to the Whig ministers and MPs. So Peel refused to form government and Whigs returned to power. The Whig government was limping but Victoria was passionately attached to Prime Minister Lord Melbourne and also refused to dismiss her female friends. It took the royal wedding of Albert and a failed attempt on their lives in the following year to revive the hatred that this gathered her from the public. Tradition number five is dress code. Inevitably within the blueprint will be the dressing guidelines. While they have become lax in recent years for most kingdoms and women are able to have more control on their garb and no longer have to wear 30 unnecessary layers, they still have certain restrictions. For example, there's the endless tabloid attention paid to the Spanish royals for their level of chic. Queen Letizia has openly broken dress code several times. In 2015, when delivering the flag to the 11th National Teach Zone of the Civil Guard, she broke the mandatory dress code of wearing all black and a Spanish mantilla in favor of a 
short and incredibly stylish white ensemble. It also violated tradition by being an outfit repeat. She wore the same white getup to her husband's proclamation as king. I can't talk about dress code violation without mentioning our baby girl Princess Diana, who had the stuffy Brits flying out of their knee-high tube socks over her sweaters and bike shorts. Meghan was also highly criticized in recent years for challenging dress code, which is prudish and bland at best in England. You aren't allowed bright nail polish and the now deceased queen forbid ladies from trousers at social events, and you had to own those big stupid hats. But she just wasn't a pious wife or an eccentric widow. Queen Elizabeth was also a bad mama. Let's get it straight in clean cut, open, honest terms. Victoria did not like children, but she loved the act of making them, especially with Albert. Unfortunately, she was wildly fertile, so you want one of those things. In those days, you got the other thing. She definitely seemed to be one of the women who lacked inherent biological maternal instinct. That's never a flaw, ladies. You aren't broken, just so you know. Because intercourse during pregnancy was believed to harm babies back then, it meant for the better part of a year, she'd be banned from intercourse or even cuddling with Albert. The two things she wanted more than kids. It's honestly quite fair from her position that she resented her children between being deprived of her husband, not wanting children in the first place, and lacking a maternal drive. Victoria, we should remember, didn't also have much of an experience of a family life, and she was raised under isolated conditions. Victoria, in many respects, was an awful mother as a result. She couldn't help but view her nine children as functional extensions of herself, expecting unquestioning obedience, and was bullying them about their failings. When Bertie, the future Edward IV, rebelled against the rigid system his parents devised for him, she called him backwards and lazy. And when Victoria, who had decided Beatrice would be the unmarried companion of her old age and forbade mentions of weddings in her presence, learned her daughter was secretly engaged, she was so angry she refused to speak to her for six months. She only relented when Beatrice agreed to live with her after they were married. This ain't just some fun and games, this is the Baccarat scandal. Queen Victoria's son, the future King Edward IV, was a notorious playboy and hedonist. His passions included eating, banging, and gambling, with the latter landing him in very hot water in 1891. It starts with a game of Baccarat during a party at the country home of a shipping millionaire. One of the players was Sir William Gordon Cumming, another infamous playboy who was once described as possibly the most handsome man in London, but certainly the rudest. Gordon Cumming was alleged to have cheated during the Baccarat game, an accusation he angrily denied. So as toddy British gents, they have a tea and a chat and come up with an agreement that all players would say nothing of this grave offense if Gordon Cumming signed a declaration promising to never play cards again as long as I live. Not a hard ask. Yeah, no, he signed it for nothing, much to Gordon Cumming's annoyance, the story did leak and became a high society gossip. And like a toddy British gent, Gordon Cumming decided to sue several of the background players for slander. The trial was a media circus, the future king appearing in the witness box and society ladies watching through their little opera glasses. Gordon Cumming did lose the case, however, the public was largely sympathetic to him and resented Edward for his part in the whole ugly affair. The prince became deeply unpopular for a time, was even booed at Ascot the same month. Another child of Elizabeth's caused a media circus that had her mama reeling, it's the scandal coded daughter. Princess Louise seemed to rebel from the moment she came into the world. She was an exceptional learner, talented, intelligent, artistic, big on women's rights movement, and the most beautiful of Victoria's four daughters. Although an artistic career, or in the words of Victoria, any career, was not appropriate for a princess, let alone a woman, the queen allowed Louise to attend art school and later the National Art Training School. Now, on to the nasty. Historians assert that Louise had an affair with her brother's tutor. Some accounts say she fell in love with him in the years of 1866 to 1870, but it's not determined if anything physical occurred or if it was just a real big crush. Hearing of Louise's infatuation for a man 14 years her senior, the queen quickly dismissed him. Louise, after a couple years, had an affair with the tutor, Walter Sterling, and she purportedly gave birth to his child. As soon as Louise gave birth, the queen arranged for the boy's adoption by the royal gynecologist, Frederick Lowcock. There's no documentation uphold it. Why would they keep that? They're trying to hide it. Louise served as an unofficial secretary for her mother from 1966 to 1871 and worked closely with the queen's assistant, private secretary, Arthur Big. Rumor has it that these two had an affair. Yet the most scandalous rumor about Louise surfaced at the death of the famed sculptor Joseph Edgar Bohm. Tales spread of him dying in her arms as they made love. In 1890, Louise married a dashing John Campbell. They did have an unhappy marriage, no children, and grew apart. At this point, Louise became romantically linked to Edward Luton's Colonel William Prober and an unnamed musician master, pissing off her mom all along the way. And because her children weren't causing Victoria enough problems, then came the Cleveland Street Scandal. One of the most sordid 
sordid scandals connected with the royals unfolded in 1889 when a post officer messenger was investigated on suspicion of theft because he was discovered to be in the possession of 14 shillings he could not have earned doing that job. The troubled youth is pressured to admit he had earned it in a male brothel. Bit of a big info drop seeing as homosexuality was super illegal back then. The son of Albert Edward is named Albert Eddie Victor and was second in line to the throne of England at the time. At 21 years of age he attended Trinity College where he made friends with Oscar Browning, a man known to favor attractive male undergraduates and was also connected to said male brothel the police just found out about. When the police uncovered then questioned those working in the brothel, apparently some names came out. Eddie! His father intervened in the investigation and no evidence against Eddie could be found or proven. That and the Cleveland Street investigation led to some working boys being given suspiciously light sentences. So there's press speculation that the indescribably loathsome scandal was being swept under the carpet to protect some high ranking visitors to the house. One VIP linked with the brothel was Lord Henry Arthur Somerset, the head of the stables. The next year Eddie became ill with what may have been venereal disease. Doctors and attendants referred to it as fever and rumors spread of Eddie's intimate relations with a chorus girl of the Gaiety Theatre, Lydia Manton, and later chorus girl, Maud Richardson. The royal family reportedly paid off Maud for her silence. Shortly after, Eddie proposed to Mary of Tech, and she accepted to great relief of the royal family. But the wedding never happens. He succumbs to influenza pandemic in 1889 to 92, and he developed pneumonia and died very shortly after his 28th birthday. Whether or not he was part of the Cleveland Street brothel scandal, we'll never truly know. Time. Many queens enjoy what's called sovereign immunity, which essentially means they cannot commit a legal wrong and are immune from civil or criminal proceedings. Let's say for example, the late Queen Elizabeth iron knuckles a guy in the mouth, Deadpool style, because her tea was too chilly, and it causes a visceral spray of blood and a need for orbital surgery. And let's say she committed this armed attack in front of her entire family on Christmas. What happens to the queen? Prosecutors could go after the crown as executive, but then the queen's ministers would act on her behalf and accept any punishment that was doled out for her. While this immunity extends to other British heads of state during their time in office, the queen is protected for life since that's how long she holds her position. And she did. So what other monarchy other than the British has this criminal immunity? Belgium's constitution states the king is voyable and his ministers are accountable too, as does Denmark's. And since 1848, the Dutch constitution states the king is immune from prosecution, the ministers are responsible. The constitution of Bhutan, Sri Lanka, and Sweden all have sovereign immunity, but without holding the ministers accountable. If a crime is committed, everyone just walks away scot-free. In places like Iceland, meanwhile, their queen can only be prosecuted with consent of parliament, and in India, no legal action can be taken against their leader as long as they're holding office, but you can get them impeached then sue, so that's something. Tradition number nine is animal hoarding. I've always hated hearing people discuss how the British queen or king, whoever is on the throne, just owns all the fishes royales. So animals like whales, dolphins, sturgeons, porpoises, and even swans, thanks to a year 1300 rule. These guys are out here completely splashing around free and clear and completely unaware that they're owned by any petty human laws. However, owning a horde of pets is quite different and Elizabeth and her corgis are nowhere near the first ruling monarch to start that tradition or build laws to protect them. Hippos were royal family animals back in ancient times Egypt and were protected by law for centuries. Dogs, however, seem to have struck the hearts of European nobility. Mary Queen of Scots spent her life with dogs and loved them so much that she had hers legally licensed and protected, keeping them with her through her exile and imprisonment, and even her most adored lap dog was found in her petticoat just minutes after her head was chopped off. Charles II of England loved spaniels just like how Elizabeth loves corgis. In 1685, the writer John Evelyn wrote in his diary that Charles loved having a number of little spaniels follow him and lie in the bedchamber. And when the old king died there, it was surrounded by the beloved dogs. Versailles, home to the Bourbon King of France from 1682 to 1789, was filthy and attracted rats. So what did they have? Cats. 
too many cats. One day, Louis the Sixteenth went to his commode, unaware that one of his Angora cats had curled up in the porcelain bowl below. And to quote, when events galvanized the cat into attacking the sovereign from below, a dazed Louis fled, stockings in hand, ringing all the bell pulls. And who could forget Josephine, the wife of Napoleon, who literally started her own private zoo. Tradition number eight is royal baby easel. This one is locked into just British monarchy, and it's more weird than messed up. The first person to learn of a new young royal's arrival to the world must be the queen. Hands down, no debate, even if a king is in the picture. But when it's time to share the news with the world, well, out comes the ceremonial golden easel and the poster board, set up smack dab outside Buckingham Palace. When Prince Louis was born in April of 2018, it was put on the same easel that announced his father, Prince William's arrival in 1982. Historically, the notices are handwritten, but today they're typed out with the time and birth just penned in. Tradition number seven is continuing patronage. Being a queen comes with a Bible, even if you aren't religious by any means or Christian. This was just set in stone as a tradition by the olden time of ergot riddled bread and corporal punishment for showing your ankles. So naturally, we still have it in place today because they knew best back then. Alrighty, anyways, the act of patronage and specifically religious patronage was very important during the Middle Ages. It became an active area of queenship studies because it was pretty much one of the only ways that queens could exert great influence. While religious patronage included the founding of religious institutions that could signal political alliances at the same time. Margaret of France, Isabella of France, and Philippa of Hainault, for example, were all patrons of Greyfriars Church in London, but that patronage was also connected to their mutual Capetian ties, the dynasty of France. With religion often shared between countries, even at times of war, it could be used manipulatively to bring bridges of truce. Being on good terms with the church could always be beneficial to medieval queens in other ways too. For example, when John of England refused to pay Benegadia of Navarre the pension she was owed as the Queen Doega and widow of Richard I, Pope Innocent III intervened on her behalf and told him to cough it up in a humble and religious way. This also earned queens consolidations as saints, even sometimes after their passing. Tradition number six is following blueprint. Remember Megan? having the Christmas dinner at the Windsor family with her mother and the whole awkward addressing of the getting laid before and after eating thing. If Megan was to follow the blueprint, she would have never stated anything about it. Rather, thank the queen for the meal and the proof that her belly is full. Now obviously, it's a pretty effed tradition and good on Megan for not taking that crap, but following the blueprint has been so driven into monarchy, especially female monarchy, that even the public was upset with her. To follow the blueprint is to mimic the royal royal woman above you, especially should you be in the presence or potentially one day taking their role. Who created the blueprint of what a medieval queen should be and how she should behave? Not any one person. Ancient Egypt felt a queen should be a certain way. Ancient Rome that a queen should stay silent. Ancient Mesoamerica, a queen was equivalent to a king and did whatever he did. It varies per culture and thus every monarchy system created its own blueprint. Within this, there was literature specifically aimed at princesses and queens within their applicable regions. For instance, Joan I of Navarre's confessor, Durand de Champagne, wrote a text named Mirror for Ladies, which advised Joan on how to be a good queen to her husband, Philip of France, in the bedroom. In China, biographies of ancient queens provided examples of rulers whose behavior was to be modeled, as well as those deemed to be a bad influence, aka your do's and don'ts book. Italian-French author Christine de Pizan's book, The Treasure of the City of Ladies, dedicated to Margaret of Burgundy, also aimed to instruct women of all classes on how to present themselves. Leader number five is Cleopatra. Everyone knows Cleopatra. There's already been so much written about it, you could drown in it. Yet, we still know next to nothing about her. But thanks to a famous smear campaign against her by hmm, everyone in ancient times, I can list off a few not so nice details about this queen to fit more into our repulsive theme. If you want to learn more about her life, maybe check out the recent Top 10 Filthy Secrets of Cleopatra That'll Make You Blush video on our channel Bumblebee. Maybe while you're at it, subscribe to The Hive if you want to see more like it. Born in 69 BCE, Cleopatra VII Tia Philopater was bred to be a ruler, having come from a long line of royal siblings having children together, which makes their family tree look a lot more like a family ladder when drawn on paper, just 
instead of like branching out roots. And apparently, sharing a bed with a cousin isn't enough, you have to share names too. About 90% of Cleopatra's family was either named Ptolemy or Cleopatra. Every now and then, a Bernice or an Arsenio was thrown in there to give us a break. I guess it would make inter-family relations a little bit less weird and more normalized if your dad, uncle, brother, brother, half-brother, brother, a new husband slash brother, all have the same name? Maybe a different Cleopatra who famously married two of her brothers and also killed at least one of them. The other one, she had somebody else do it for. Tradition number four is pretty pressure. Essentially, queens were expected to be the ultimate good woman, a model of virtuous behavior. They were expected to be good wives and mothers as well as good rulers, but they were also meant to be pious peacemakers and to look pretty, but not so pretty you don't want to respect them, but also still pretty enough you want to pay attention. Think about that Barbie monologue. That naturally comes with the endless critique. Beauty was obviously a huge part of a queen's role and they were expected to represent contemporary ideals. William Caxton in his 15th century book The Game and Play of Chess states that the queen ought to be a fair lady sitting in their chair and crowned with a corona on her head and clad with cloth of gold. She should also, he writes, take care to be chaste, wise, of honest life and well mannered. It's interesting that beauty is the very first quality that Caxton names in his text and we can see this in other sources of medieval era such as the Welsh Triads, or the 13th century Las Diet Patridias, Kingdom Law Book, where it's written that the qualities that kings should look for in a bride is the more beautiful the queen is, the more the king will love her, and the more handsome their children will be. No mention of being a good political leader. So it's really interesting, again, seeing how these ideals of queenship tied together. Alfonso was basically equating the idea that a beautiful woman will make a good wife and a good mother, which takes us back full circle to those expectations of medieval queens to be everything. Tradition number three is tax exemption. This one sucks. Imagine you happen to be born in random luck of the draw bloodline and just don't have to pay taxes. Quite a few countries had laws in regards to their leaders, be it king or queen, being exempt from tax. Queen Elizabeth wasn't required and now neither is Charles. However, Elizabeth had been voluntarily paying income and capital gain taxes since 1992. Her grandsons are also paying their taxes, but do not have to. King Juan Carlos, Spain's former monarch, has paid about $820,000 in back taxes amid an investigation by prosecutors into whether he and other royal members of the royal family used bank accounts in other people's names to hide assets from tax authorities. The payment announcement came just a month after the Spanish media revealed an investigation into possible tax evasion and that occurred after Juan abdicated in 2014 and was no longer shielded by immunity from prosecution. The extent of that immunity has become an issue in previous corruption cases, but it remains an unsettled question. The Belgian royal family no longer holds any power, but receives large payments for their advisements and roles as, not to be rude, figureheads. These payments are always taxed, as are the family. Dutch royals are among the monarchies exempt from paying income tax still. Last year, the Prime Minister Mark Rutte rejected opposition demands to scrap the exemption. His government proposed an annual royal budget of 50.2 million pounds for 2023 untaxed. Tradition number two is no ID needed. Royal prerogative is a special exemption statute from certain statute laws. England is famous for allowing its queen or king the right to no driver's license, no upholding of speed limits, and traveling without needing of a passport. That that means even though Queen Elizabeth preferred to stick to driving on her private estates, she could technically go speeding around London and running red lights if she wanted to. Japan's Emperor Narhito and Empress Masako are also exempt, as stated in a ministry document dated for May 10th of 1971. Apparently it would be highly inappropriate to issue a passport to the Emperor or Empress. The document also stated that it will be highly inappropriate for the Emperor to undergo immigration or visa procedures using a passport as an ordinary citizen. The Dutch head of state, similar to Elizabeth, does not require a passport for the reason that all passports in his country are technically issued by him. So it'd be funny for the king to have a passport where he himself has to ask for permission to allow himself into another country. Tradition number one is two birthdays. The two birthday tradition for British monarch dates back to 1748 when King George II combined the annual summer military march with his birthday celebration, which should have been during the winter. As to quote, with a November birthday being too cold for celebratory parades, he tied his celebration in with the annual Trooping of the Color military parade. Trooping the Color, a military parade, has its origins on the battlefield. A regime flag or colors was a key rallying point for soldiers during battles 
obviously you gotta recognize your own flag. To ensure soldiers would recognize it, the flag was marched around, aka trooped for the ranks to see. A regiment's colors came to have huge significance for serving soldiers, and the gain or loss of colors were seen as decisive moments in battle. Nowadays, since it also doubles as a birthday party where the kid invited his whole class, the marching of troops is a spectacular and boring display of 1400 parading soldiers, 400 horses, and 400 musicians. The monarch arrives at the beginning, looks over the troop, the band performs, the bagpipe guys proceed to make an obtrusive wall of noise, and then they all start marching. The royal carriage follows along. Alright, thank you for tuning in to another Bumblebee video. Take some time to subscribe to The Hive to see some more of them, and I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe to see more from us, and I'll see you next time.